Welcome to the Weekly Stuff Podcast with Jonathan Lack and Sean Chapman. We are here to talk about stuff this week on the show. We will be reviewing Marvel's Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings. Uh, our review delayed by one week because Sean's theater had uh, plumbing problems, but your theater did not have plumbing problems now and you have seen the movie, is that correct? Yes, I, I went yesterday with my dad. It is the first time I like he has seen the movie in like a year and a half or something in the movie theater. It's been like since the Kimetsu Yaiba movie. And yes, I went to a movie theater. I sat down. I watched a movie. It was really fucking good. Yeah, nice. So so you're a fan of the movie. I'm a fan of the movie. We'll talk about it. Should be. I think there's a lot of interesting stuff to break down with this one. Mm-hmm. So it'll be a fun one to talk about. That'll be the main uh, topic of the episode. A couple of pieces of news before we hit that, uh, including the trailer for the new Matrix movie and a bunch of game stuff out of a PlayStation event that was this week. Basically, PlayStation did their sort of big... E3 style thing, but this week it wasn't quite that big, but it was bigger than we were expecting, so there's some stuff to talk about. Yes, yeah, video, some video game news happened, and and yeah, movie news. It's It feels like there's been a while since we had a big chunk of like entertainment world news to even talk about. That's very true. Um, so yeah, that'll be the main uh, substance of the episode. Sean, do you have any stuff going on you want to talk about? The main stuff for me uh, is I, uh, you know, I watched all those Marvel shows. Uh, so we did our for our podcast last week, and and I did have Disney Plus for that. But the real reason why I got Disney Plus in the first place was not to watch those Marvel shows, which were fine. It was to watch uh, the new Star Wars animated series, Star Wars: The Bad Batch, which just last night I finished watching. Um, the, the so it's sixteen episodes for one season, and they have already said that they're making a second one, which is awesome. Because this is the new CG animated series from Dave Filoni's team. So it's the same people who made Star Wars The Clone Wars and Star Wars Rebels. Um, and so it, it is fucking awesome. Uh, if, you have, uh, if you have enjoyed any of the CG animated Star Wars series so far, uh, this is like maybe, I think, the best, certainly, of like for any of them at the beginning. Um, this is, it's a really, really strong first season. Um, that basically the premise is uh, it is set immediately after the end of episode three, or like the first episode is kind of contiguous with the things that happen in Revenge of the Sith, and then most of the season happens in like the couple of months following the end of episode three, uh, which is actually a period in Star Wars history that there are not a lot of stories told. There's lots of stories in that gap, but most of the stories in the gap are either like Jedi Fallen Order, where they're somewhere in the middle between episodes three and four, or they're like Rebels, where it's like kind of right up against when episode four happens. This is right after the fall of the Republic, and it's about the establishment of the Empire. And it's all from the perspective of a group of clone troopers called the Bad Batch, who they're kind of an elite group of clone troopers that all have different mutations, so they're not perfect clones. And those mutations are advantageous to them in the field. So one of them is like a big kind of bruiser type guy. One of them is like very skinny, but super intelligent. One of them has like enhanced senses. So because that they're these like kind of um, unusual clones, Order 66 didn't work on them. So the first episode, which is basically like almost a movie, I think it's about 70 minutes long, um, is all about the events of episode three in Order 66 and all that happening from their perspective, which is fucking awesome because it's this fascinating story where all of a sudden all the other clones turn on a dime and the Bad Batch have absolutely no idea what the fuck's even going on. And then from there, it is about them sort of trying to figure out where their place is in the galaxy now that the Republic that they had been literally bred and like born to fight for has just dissolved in front of them and all of their brothers are now a part of the Empire while the Empire is also slowly phasing out the clone troopers because it's too expensive and they just want to use propaganda and fascism to get their stormtroopers. So it's a really, really awesome kind of story and setting in Star Wars um, that I've always been interested in that idea of what is that transition period, what happens to like Kamino and the clones and all of that, which is a story that maybe there have been like a novel or something in the past that has tried to dive into that, but none of like the major Star Wars media has ever told that story. And uh, this first season of The Bad Batch is all about that, and it is fucking great. So if people are into Star Wars, particularly if you like the other Dave Filoni stuff, this is like an easy recommend. I think it's like one of the best things they've done. And even if you haven't watched 
Clone Wars or Rebels. There are characters and some ideas and things that do come from Clone Wars. Either, you know, you get some characters from Clone Wars that this is like the latest point in the timeline we've seen them. And there are also some characters from Star Wars Rebels that this is like when they were very young. Um, but generally speaking, whenever that kind of thing happens, it's always contextualized from the Bad Batch's perspective, and they don't know any of those characters. So even if you haven't watched the other shows, I think that Bad Batch is actually a pretty good jumping on point because it's really good. It's really tight. Um, the cast of characters for the Bad Batch is really are really compelling, and they the only other thing they've ever been in is one story arc from the Clone Wars that you don't need to watch because they reintroduce all the characters here. So if people are interested in these 3D CG Star Wars uh, series, I think that this is probably the one to watch if you want to kind of whet your appetite and see what all this stuff is about. It's certainly fewer episodes <laughs> so yes. far. Um, no, that's awesome. I still need to catch up on all the Star Wars animated stuff. I there's a bad. I don't know if it's this same group of characters, but isn't there a Bad Batch story pretty early in the run of Clone Wars? I remember there being episodes about that in like when I was um, watching. No, it. that's so there is a group of. Um, clone troopers that because that's the one you kind of start with that rookies episode where you have fives yeah. and echo they're not the bad batch they're just like kind of like a group of rookies that you kind okay, of follow right. at different points um this is a distinct set of characters although there is some crossover in a different way that's kind of too complicated to get into but there is some crossover with some of the clones from those stories from the show but the core bad batch cast is was introduced in that most recent season, season seven, that they did like the extra final season last year for right. Disney Plus. Awesome, yeah. Well, it's very cool to see this continuing because obviously, like people love these stories. For a while after Disney took over, it wasn't clear if they were going to be doing this. Then we got season seven of Clone Wars. They're doing the Bad Batch. It's they're all in on the the Dave Filoni verse, and that's a good place to be. It's uh, it's much better than being all in on like J.J. Abrams movies. <laughs> yes, yeah, it is definitely. You know, I, if if the price we had to pay to get this in Clone Wars Season 7 in The Mandalorian is we had to just have the most god-awful fucking Star Wars movie in Episode 9, that's a price worth paying. Because this is like some, as far as I'm concerned, this is some primo Star Wars shit. I think like if you are particularly like if you love the setting and the world of Star Wars and like some like the politics and stuff like that, there's some stuff in this show that is so cool like it's just the kind of story i've wanted to see for a long time and they do it better than i would have imagined yeah i might just have to jump in and watch the bad batch i'll i want to do the whole thing at some point but you know the clone wars itself isn't in chronological order so who cares just you know watch good star wars stuff yeah like the only thing i think you need to have seen are the prequel movies to like get the sort of fundamental story going yeah. on and all the other stuff is like some fun extras of oh hey there's hera from star wars rebels and she's a kid like that's cool but you don't need to know that eventually she's in her own tv show she's just a character in this show when she shows up um and stuff like that so it's it's i think it's um pretty kind of self-contained in that sense in a way that's really cool it, it seems also like a very smart move because there's probably a whole new audience to these shows on Disney+. Mm -hmm. Plus, and it's a lot less intimidating to say, watch one season of The Bad Batch, which all you need is really the prequels, than, hey, there's 10 years of Clone Wars and Rebels yeah. and, you know, more than 10. I mean, it's been a long time since that, like, debuted in, like, 07, 08. So it's crazy. Um, they've been doing this a long time. Yep, and, and it's been good the whole time and it's still good now. Awesome. Well, that's really good to hear. Um, I have not watched or really played anything of note other than playing Genshin Impact. I finally got all my fishing done and got the catch weapon for Raiden Shogun. I've, also, I've got her fully leveled up. I got that weapon fully leveled up. She is now a main on my team. I have my new five-star, complete five-star team complete of Mona, Raiden Shogun, um, Yoimiya, and Kamisato. And... Uh, it's making the game trivially easy sometimes mm. <laughs> because that is such a crazy... Raiden Shogun is like... There was a thing today where I, it was in the story where I... Or some quest where I had to fight some treasure hunters. And I pulled out Raiden Shogun and started... And like all the treasure hunters had done was steal a little fossil. And I'm going... It was in the fishing quest line that's going on uh -huh, right now. Yeah. And I go and I... And they're like, we know we don't want to give you the fossil. And then I pull out a literal god and cut them in half with lightning. And I'm like, this feels like... This is like a weird ludonarrative dissonance where I'm like, I don't know if I should be doing this to these poor treasure hunters. This is mean. Yeah, you're pulling out like the sword that slayed a snake god in like <laughs> cutting a dimension in half. And then it yes. just does like 100,000 damage and they all die. Yeah. 
It's crazy. I love it. It's it's the kind of like you can pull off damage combos with Raiden Shogun and then some of those other characters I have that like w- will tank the frame rate and it's great. It's just mm-hmm. like and not take the frame rate even because of like uh like effects going on on screen. It's because of the amount of different damage counters that are flashing up and that's really funny to me. Um, so I'm having a blast. I'm enjoying the new fishing event they're doing. Um, you know, I have, I have had a very busy week and I have not had a lot of free time, so that's been fun. I've been slowly chipping away at Gundam Build Fighters Try, which I'm enjoying. That'll be our next Gundam episode that, that we're doing. That'll be next week. Um, but yeah, so, so that's kind of been my stuff. I don't, I don't have a ton to talk about. Yeah, yeah, because the, on the video game side, I have only been playing Genshin Impact. I have, I have, uh, my Raiden Shogun has been leveled up for a while, but I now have, uh, Kujo Sada up to level 70, which is high enough for her to, since she's like a support character, I've been messing around with her, um, because since I, I pulled a ridiculous number of hers in the, uh, banner, I have her at Constellation 6, which gives you a 60% electro damage buff when Kujo buffs characters, or at least 60% electro crit damage, which I'm now experimenting with, like, how to use her in teams with Raiden Shogun, and if you, like, it's a little bit tricky because you have to be very tight on the timing for how long the buff lasts. But if you land stuff with that and you time everything properly, like you do fucking stupid amounts of damage and it's great. And I love I love having them, Ryan Shogun and Sada on a team together because it just feels very narratively appropriate that she's out there with, with her Tengu buddy. Um, nice. Yeah. I haven't used Kujo Sara. I my brother and I have been playing a lot of co-op where he can't come into my world yet because he's several world levels lower than me. Mm-hmm. But I'll go into his world and honestly what I do mostly is just help him like do things in the game and, and so he can like get through stuff faster. It's also how I got all of the level up material for Raiden Shogun because it was right. just trivially easy to beat that boss with my characters. Um, but he will often... He's had Kujo Sara out because he's leveled her up and he got a bunch of her when he... Cause, Again, I got Raiden Shogun so fast, I barely did any pulls in that banner. So I have Kujo Sara, but I didn't get like 10 of her or anything. Um, but he's used her, and, and we've we've done some of those combos, and it's cool. So definitely a cool character. And yeah, I actually, yeah. I, should, I should say, I haven't just been playing Genshin Impact. I don't know why I forgot this, because I was almost late to the podcast because I was playing this. I've been playing the new WarioWare game. WarioWare Get oh, It cool. Together on Nintendo Switch. Um, I had played the demo a couple weeks ago when I was at home in Colorado hanging out with my family... And my brother and I, because it's a co-op WarioWare, or it can be co-op, um, and I really liked that demo, so I got the full game when it came out the other day, and I have not played a ton of it yet, but I've gotten like most of the basic characters and gone through a lot of the intro, intro levels, and um, you know, if you if you like WarioWare, you like WarioWare. You know, if you don't know what WarioWare is, it's the whole micro game concept where you go, they flash like an instruction on screen, and you have to do it very fast. This game's whole gimmick, because every WarioWare game has like a different unique gimmick. This game's gimmick is that all the different characters uh, in the WarioWare series are playable for the first time, and you go through and it randomly alternates which character you have for each micro game, and they all play differently, and so every micro game you have to approach differently depending on which character you're using. Um, and in co-op, this creates beautiful chaos, but even on your own, it's really fun because I, I really liked the, uh, the Kotaku, the Kotaku review of this WarioWare game because they, they put into words something I've always liked about WarioWare, which is that it kind of replicates in small bite-sized chunks, just the basic, like fun of getting into video games, which is Mm -hmm. like playing a game you don't know and having to figure out the, like, the mechanics of and how it works and how you should play it. They use the example of like the, on the hardest end of the spectrum is like a Dark Souls where it's like unlearn everything you've ever learned and learn it again, right? Um, but WarioWare does it in these like five second chunks over and over and that's kind of the beauty of it is it's these very, very simple games that you have to figure out how to play right off the bat. And what's really cool about WarioWare Get It Together is because of that character dynamic where you have all these different characters, there's two layers to it. There's figuring out the micro game, but also how do you apply the character that you're playing as and their control scheme to playing this specific micro game, which also makes it feel, I haven't played a ton of it yet, but it feels immediately like it might be more replayable than some other WarioWares because of that. Because you're not just mm-hmm. mastering the games, you're also mastering this kind of level of randomness that's going through with it. Um, and then all of the other stuff is just like, it's very good top shelf WarioWare, the micro games are cool. Um, 
this is the first one they've done for a console in a very long time so it's got very cool visuals they're able to do a lot of cool stuff like when you get to nine volt all of his levels as usual are based on classic nintendo games and now like based on a lot of nintendo switch games like there's a breath of the wild thing there's all sorts of there's a splatoon thing um and they're able to like graphically reproduce a lot of these games in cool ways so it's just a blast it's a good game um they priced it a little lower which is nice it's a 50 dollars game instead of a 60 dollars game um which feels fair uh so so i'm enjoying it it's a fun little game i want to play more my brother is coming out to visit me in a couple of weeks so i also kind of wanted to have it because it'll be a really fun if you have someone to play a co-op with i think that's where the game really comes to life but it is i was i was happy to see that it is still like very good solo it is not like it's neutered solo which i sometimes worry about with something like this Mm -hmm. um but yeah it's a really cool game and uh i'm just glad i'm glad warioware is getting his nintendo switch day in the sun i would love one day for them to make another actual wario land game i've been waiting on that since i was like eight years old Uh um because those games were fucking great and people don't even know about them anymore but you know warioware is also good and you know you get charles martinet doing crazy lines and it's fun yeah, that's, it's it's nice that WarioWare is back because it had been a long time. I mean, I, and I'm with you on Wario Land because what was it? Four was the one on Game Boy Advance. Yes, uh, that game fucking ruled. So they all they were great. Yeah. Wario Land, Wario Land on Game Boy, the original Game Boy, is one of the first games I ever played. Because um, when I got my Game Boy Color, it was my first game system, and Wario Land was one of the first games I had, and I loved it. And yeah, four ruled, um, and those are all great. So more of that, please. But any, I will take any Wario. Wario just tends to come with good games. It's a very weird thing about mm-hmm. Wario that his games just tend to be very good. <laughs> so. I mean, they're, Nintendo's just a lot more selective about it. You know, they know this like, eh, Mario, you can throw him in whatever. Eh, you'll just do some Mario Tennis bullshit. Wario, if you're going to put Wario's name on a game, you need to make sure that's some premium fucking high quality video game or he won't he won't join right like he, his, his he, contract very, is rock solid yeah like he's very selective about the projects uh, that he chooses to work with uh, and i respect that absolutely uh why was having a good year he's also like the star of the he and waluigi are like the stars of the story mode in the mario golf game this year and it's very funny so you know so maybe it's the year of wario low-key but anyway yeah that's what i've been up to anything else before we jump into the news sean i think that's it for me what's going on in the news jonathan well, I want to start with one just crushingly sad piece of news this week, uh, which is the death of the actor Michael K. Williams, uh, who died this week at the age of 54. I just wanted to quickly pay tribute. Um, you know, he was, I think, unquestionably one of the great actors in the history of American television, most famous for his role as Omar on The Wire on HBO. But he was on a bunch of HBO shows, also famous for his role on Boardwalk Empire, which he's fantastic in. He plays Chalky White. Um, He was on The Night Of, he was in Lovecraft Country last year, and is currently up for an Emmy for that, and likely to win um, before his his death. I think he was considered the frontrunner, that would have been his first Emmy, Um, and sadly died young at the age of 54. I think he was just, you know, Omar is one of the great characters in the history of American television, but he was always great. He was always sort of parts of ensembles where he could simultaneously be a part of that ensemble and not like overwhelm it, but also be the most interesting player on screen when he was there. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, The Wire is certainly a testament to that, but it's true of wherever he showed up. And I also think he was just a, clearly a beautiful soul. Just Just a really fascinating and interesting person who had, you know, he talked about having struggled with drug addiction. Um, and, and overcome that to do amazing things um and you know um it's it's heartbreaking this is one of those uh deaths of an artist that hit me pretty fucking hard because there was just there's this little weird moment of serendipity where so this week in my intro to film theory class i was teaching the movie modern times by charlie chaplin And I had gotten done with my lecture for that week, and that was on a Tuesday, and I go home. We were going to show the movie tomorrow morning on a Wednesday, and I go home and I'm working on my my notes for tomorrow, and and then this news comes down on Twitter, and one of the things that someone tweeted was the Criterion Collection has for a long time done this series where they invite actors and directors and other film artists into what they call the closet, which is this big room at the Criterion offices where they have all of their releases they've ever done. 
and from this was like from 10 years ago um, when they invited Michael K. Williams in. And one, that dude had impeccable taste. One of the best like versions of that video I've seen in terms of picking really good movies out from the closet. Um, but also that ends with him picking out Modern Times and doing this very funny little pantomime thing like he's Charlie Chaplin. And uh, that just kind of broke me. That, that was like, uh, that was really hard. And then I, I did show that video to my class the next day just as like a little introduction because, you know, beautiful actor, you know, movie history, just this little moment of serendipity. Um, but he will definitely be missed. Um, he would, man, he, I don't know if we ever saw even half of what he was fully capable of. What a, what an amazing artist. Yeah. I haven't seen the wire, so I haven't seen a lot of like his big stuff, but it's like the, his kind of work on that show. It's a lot like, um, James Gandolfini on The Sopranos, right? That is like even if you yeah. hadn't seen the show, it's like you're like very aware of the character. You've seen scenes, like you've seen him as an actor, and yeah, it's it is it is even even not having a lot of like personal connection to to the work he's done because I haven't seen it. It still like felt very impactful. Um, it's like it, I think it's like the mark of like the 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 history and the impact of an artist is that like even if you haven't experienced what they've done firsthand you still like get the ripples of it throughout the culture because of how how big it was so yeah it's Bur very sad. Bur president barack obama <laughs> said that omar was his favorite character on television you know like this mm -hmm. is yeah the talk about you know rising up the hierarchy <laughs> you know um and you know if you have never seen the wire and I mean you, both Sean and just the general you. Yes. Um, now, now would be a great moment, both be, to honor and see what Michael K. Williams was capable of, but also because that show just was relevant when it came out and is frankly probably more relevant than it's ever been right now. Um, and is you know as close as American television has ever come, and probably like honestly in the mainstream can come to actually grappling with like the inequities of policing in America and issues like that. Um, it's a it's a masterpiece of a show you know it's often you know that and the sopranos are often vying for like what's the best show in like american tv history for for good reason um yeah so anyway just wanted to mention that and uh rest in peace yeah all right let's talk about some more uplifting stuff this week sean we got a movie trailer i have been waiting a long time for we uh -huh. got the trailer for Lana Wachowski's The Matrix Resurrections. Finally has a title. It's been The Matrix 4 for a long time. I think we all assumed it was going to be The Matrix Resurrections. Yeah, it's, but... it wasn't a particularly surprising title because they already used Reloaded. So, you yeah. know, if you're going to bring it back, what else? What other RE words? You know, they could have done The Matrix Revival, I guess. They can say that for the next time around, though. Yeah. Uh, Sean, I think this is one of, like, hands down, the best movie trailers I've ever seen. It's very it fucking is, good. Yeah. It is Unbel like I just like even if I didn't care about the Matrix, it is like impeccably well made. Like it is all scored to the classic, you know, uh, I think it's Jefferson Airplane song White Rabbit, yeah. and it is the original version. It's not some shitty like pop cover. It's yeah, the actual that song. part made me very happy. This like thanks for just actually using the song and not some sort of like thing where you watch like the first minute of the trailer and you're like. I know this song. What the fuck is it? And then eventually the chorus comes up. You're like, oh, it's this like weird version of White Rabbit. Like, why not just use the song? The actual song is better than this weird slowed down drama pop version of it. And they, they mix it with some like score near the end to like kind of amp it up. But it's just the song. It is so well like cut and scored to that. It does such a good job kind of like teasing you with like the general premise of this movie, but making you really like excited to see what it is i don't know i just i think every beat of it i've seen it a couple times and then yesterday when i i went to see shang chi again sean so we could talk about it and just uh, refresh my memory on the movie and they showed the trailer before shang chi mm -hmm. and just seeing it on the big screen too i think it's a gorgeous trailer um good god it, it, you know you got keanu reeves but keanu reeves looking like john wick now yeah um and it's just something that i noted like keanu reeves is like definitively a man who became more handsome and interesting looking the older he got. Yes. Like, you compare him to, like, in the original Matrix movies or Bill and Ted. Bill and Ted, I guess he's got longer hair. But in the Matrix movies, he's, like, very clean cut, clean shaven. And it's like, no. Keanu Reeves is at his best when he has long hair and a beard. 
that is Keanu to me. Um, and I love that, like, Lana Wachowski clearly agrees and kept that for Matrix Resurrections. But it's, I just also think it's a, it's such a fascinating, like, gauntlet throw for a fourth movie. What they're doing with this, which if you haven't seen the trailer, is very clearly, this is meta as fuck in some way. Where in the original Matrix trilogy, Neo and Trinity are dead. They are very dead at the end of those movies. It is not ambiguous in the slightest. They are fucking dead. And they are the only two returning characters in this. So they are the only two actors that we see again. And they're revived in some way. Neo is back as Thomas Anderson. But everything else is different. Down to having a different actor playing Morpheus. Or a roughly Morpheus equivalent. Um, I'm really fascinated in it. And... I was saying this to my brother last night. We were talking about the trailer and like, you know, we are living, we are so inundated with like the part fours or like the latter day revival of this thing that was ended and closed off. And like the Wachowski, not the Wachowskis because Lily Wachowski is not working on this, but Lana Wachowski coming in and doing this with the Matrix and kind of making this movie clearly like about that idea makes me more excited than I already would be because the Wachowskis have lifetime buy-in from me. They... Whether it's good or bad, anything they make is going to be interesting and risky, and that's all you can ask for at a certain point. So, yeah, I'm I'm very excited for this. <laughs> yeah, and, and it feels like the timing is good in the sense of, like, it's been long enough that it feels like there's something meaningful to be had to going back to The Matrix and the ideas of that movie series and, like, looking at it from a modern perspective and stuff. Like, I think it's just a good... It's like, it feels right to me to go back to that. Now all they need to do is just do an HD remake of Enter the Matrix um, so that we can get the, <laughs> we can experience the full Matrix story um, in high quality because Enter the Matrix is a canonical piece of the Matrix, as is the Matrix Online, um, where Morpheus, of course, meets his uh, unfortunate end. But, yeah, I, there's so much to talk about here. One thing I wanted to mention with that, Sean... So we clearly, we need to do our Matrix, like, retrospective series, right? Yeah, I think we, we just sort of been waiting for it until this gets close enough, right? Yeah. Uh, because I was, I was it fair- is, like, the big missing piece in our, like, Star Wars, Lord of the Rings, um, and all those, the Spider-Man, Spider-Man. And going back to those trilogies from late 90s, yeah. early 2000s. Um, and I knew that that was coming because I, I bought the fucking 4K Blu-rays, like, six months ago when they were on sale. I'm like, yeah. I'm just going to hold on to these because it's going to come up soon. Right, so I think maybe we'll put a pin in that and we'll start it probably in around October. Um, do we need to like, do, so three episodes for the three movies, do we need to do an episode on Enter the Matrix where we make ourselves play that game? I would absolutely, I don't know, we might have to emulate it, I don't know how you play that game. I mean, it's an original Xbox in PS2 game. You would, um, I mean, you PS2, you could emulate yeah. pretty easily. I would, I would 100% be down for that and for uh, Path of Neo. At the very <laughs> least, Path of Neo for the bonkers as fuck ending bonkers thing fuck ending. i just you know i love the matrix and i love the matrix sequels um i am unabashed on that um you know especially after i sort of revisited them as an adult a couple of years ago and then i rewatched them this year in 4k those sean you are in for a treat with those blu-ray the new 4k blu-rays because those are movies that did not have good normal yeah. blu-rays so like the 4k discs were a chance to like fix it and they did um and I just love this series. And as you say, like, this is such an interesting time to be coming back to The Matrix. And I think one of the most interesting things about this trailer and the marketing around the movie is how hard it is leaning into the red pill, blue pill thing, uh-huh. which has been co opted by, like, the far right, QAnon, all these terrible groups. And we know Lana Wachowski does not like that <laughs> for a variety of reasons. Yeah. One, we can just assume she wouldn't like that because these are groups um, fundamentally opposed to her, like, basic identity as a human. Um, But also, like, she has talked about this on Twitter and in interviews. And so I I am really fascinated to see what she does with the Matrix in an age where the idea of, like, living in a simulation where we do not agree on a shared reality is a much more, like, real and pressing issue than I think it was in 1999. Where I think in the original Matrix, it's more of a bigger philosophical, like, this is a discussion we've been having since the Industrial Revolution kind of thing. You know what I mean? Um, And this is very pressing. And, you know, I I have my own sort of theories on what's going on in this trailer. We don't have to go all into it. But, you know, uh, I'm looking forward to it. I miss that Lawrence Fishburne is not here. But I also understand that it seems so intentional that, like, who is back and who is not. 
and like why they're doing it the way they're doing it and the person who is playing our morpheus equivalent here yaya abdul mateen is wonderful we love we've loved him in several things he was in watchmen he played dr mm -hmm. manhattan in the watchmen hbo show um and i think he's great in this trailer so i am excited for all of that yeah and i just i appreciate that they're still leaning into like the black leather like the sunglasses it's like they're yes. they're not trying to modernize it in any way in that in like that way right it is it's still it looks like the matrix which i'm excited for because just like what computers in the internet is and like fashion and all of that is in a very different place than it was in like 1999 but i don't care i want it to be weird green code <laughs> on a screen i want everyone to have flip phones i want i, I want it to be that right i want yes. like the the black trench coats that look like it has to be like you must have heat stroke if you wear that thing for more than fucking an hour in the sun um th that's what i want yeah and uh, it's great. You know, we talk about Keanu. It's also just cool to see Carrie Ann Moss back yes. there. We love her. Um, yeah, it's it's going to be cool. I Like, this movie could fucking suck, and I would be interested in it, because, like, it's going to be... It's inevitably, it feels like it's going to be a big swing and not the safe, like, oh, no, we didn't defeat the machines, you know? Like, it's very clearly not, like, the Force Awakens version of The Matrix, yeah. it feels like. So, that's good. Yeah, I'm excited. I'm I'm excited too. That's December. We will Sean when when we're finished talking, we will we will plan out our Matrix series and figure out what all we will be covering cuz fuck it, we might as well also do the Animatrix. There's a lot. Yes. There's a lot yeah. we can cover. I, and I haven't watched the last time I've watched a Matrix movie was I rewatched The Matrix maybe in like 2015 or 2016, but I don't think I've seen the sequels since like the mid 2000s. I think I watched them both at least. I definitely watched the Reloaded a couple of times because we had that DVD. I think I only saw Revelations once outside of the theater. So, yeah, it's been a long time for me to go back to the Matrix. So I'm excited. All right. Well, there you go. Uh, last piece of news today is a bunch of pieces of news because PlayStation had a little event thingy. I don't know what what they call it. The PlayStation think, Showcase? Yes, I think it was called the PlayStation Showcase. I don't know why they didn't just call it the State of Play. Like, you already have a name for the things you do. You know, like, Nintendo doesn't call their bigger Nintendo Directs, like... They don't call it the Nintendo Showcase. They just call it, hey, it's a Nintendo Direct. Uh, it feels like, like, be consistent with the branding is what I would like. Honestly, I forgot it was happening because they weren't calling it a State of Play. <laughs> yeah. So, like, there was no... Anyway, doesn't matter. There was a lot of big stuff. So, I am going through... I'm going to go through the order that they have it in. I don't know if this was the order they showed things in, but there was a Kotaku article that I pulled up that just summarized everything. So I'm just going to yeah. go through in their this, order. This kind of cuts out all the third-party game trailers, which is fine, because I don't think we need to talk about... You okay. know, there's some good ones uh, here and there, or it looks like maybe they threw them at the end of the... There's um, a, they, they show them at the end, but yeah. Okay. yeah there's, there's a couple to talk about. But yeah. let's start with uh, probably like the biggest news on Twitter, at least the one that like got through to me, is that Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic is getting a full remake on PlayStation 5. Holy shit. Yeah, so this was... The, it's a very small teaser video that is basically you hear Jennifer Hale, who's Bastila in KOTOR, or Knights of the Old Republic. Uh, she does a little bit of voiceover. Um, and then a red lightsaber turns on, and it's Darth Revan, um, who is a very major figure from that first game. Um, and yeah, it, it is very sparse on any details other than it seems to be at the very least a like console launch exclusive. Like this is one of those where I'm not sure like what the situation is in terms of is it going to be available on other platforms? Will it be available on other platforms later? Any of that kind of stuff, or even what is it like it's obviously going to be a full remake because this is not a we have hd defied kotor because they've done that a couple of times at this point um but like the scope of are they going to change the combat system are they going to change this or that like there's not any details here all we know is they're bringing fucking kotor back they're doing a a full ground up uh remake of it and you know kotor is one of my absolute most favoriteest games ever and i'm very excited for this because uh because the original KOTOR is very easily accessible on modern devices. Like, it can run on, like, any fucking PC you have or Mac. Or Mac, yeah. Um, you can just play KOTOR. So it's, like, it's not the kind of thing where it feels, you know, like Demon's Souls. With that remake, it is hard to play Demon's Souls if you don't have a PS3. So it's, like, that remake is also a form of, like, just being able to fucking play that game. Um, whereas this, 
I feel like I feel very happy letting them do whatever they want with this remake and changing as much as they want because the original is right there. The original is amazing. Um, so I'm very excited to see what they do in approaching KOTOR in 2021 and how they kind of assess it and what they change and what they don't. Yeah, because I... So I have never played much of KOTOR, but I have tried many times. I have it on my PC. I've had it on my Mac. I have it on my Xbox because they re-released on, on Xbox One and Series X. You can play the original Xbox code through backwards compatibility. And I have just never gotten that deep into this game because, frankly, I find the combat confusing and alienating. It's um, just turn-based combat. It just plays in real time. I, I under... Sean... I have had people tell this to me many times, uh -huh. and I don't know how else to tell you. I don't fucking get it, and I don't find it fun. I don't know what else to say. That's been my experience. I have tried many times. People are frustrated with me. Fuck it. That's my viewpoint. And maybe there's others of me, and that's why they're doing a remake. Um, because that is kind of what I'm interested in here is uh, this is just... I am, I am, and you know this about me, I am very rarely the person who says a game feels dated and I have trouble playing it. I am often the opposite of that. KOTOR is just one of those for me, um, and so I am excited for the remake. This sounds very cool. Yes, I just, you know, it's, I, I just want some cool Star Wars shit. There was a weird, so I read the, when after they made this announcement, just because I wanted to see as many details as I could. And there's just, there's not much, but there was a PlayStation blog post that had a little bit more information on it. But the PlayStation blog post starts with, like, one of the most beloved Star Wars Legends stories ever. And I had to be reminded of the whole stupid Disney canon Star Wars bullshit where KOTOR even though nothing, KOTOR is set like 5,000 years or something, some ridiculous amount of time before the movies, nothing else is set around it. It's, it's, I find the idea that it's like a Star Wars legend story instead of a Star Wars story is very annoying. But, um, you know, that branding and all that stuff is weird. Because KOTOR, it's, it's like one of the best Star Wars things there is. So if more people get to uh, play that story and experience those characters, like I'm curious if they're going to re-record VA or they're going to use, use all the voice acting from the original um, game and stuff like that. Because uh, all the stuff with Jennifer Hale in the trailer was clearly new. Like it was not recordings from the original game. Um, but whatever form it takes, I just hope they do a good job of it and that people get to experience that story in that world um, and all that stuff uh, with fresh eyes. Because it is fucking awesome yeah why on earth would it have to be a star wars legends like why not use the remake and say and now we're rechristening it as part of the timeline because who fucking cares like it's so yeah, stupid every everybody loves kotor like any star wars fan that has touched it loves that game and it is so removed from everything else it doesn't affect any canon and if you want to have an other a different old star wars narrative that's set way before the other star wars movies there's like an infinite amount of time it can be set in before those movies because it's a fake, non-real fictional universe that can be whenever. It's just like, just let it be Star Wars. Don't call it a Star Wars Legends story. Yeah. If they, if the fucking like box for this game has like Star Wars Legends plastered all over it, I I will yeah. not buy a boxed copy at Because I mean, that's what they did <laughs> when they like reprinted all the books and stuff like that. And now all the yeah. books from that period, if you buy a modern version, all have Star Wars Legends. It's not the real Star Wars. It's like, fuck off. It's better than most of your real Star Wars. You know, Sean, real Star Wars is where um, Rey uses two lightsabers instead of one. And then she defeats Palpatine. And then she gets the yellow lightsaber. And yeah. she's Luke now. This isn't one of those fake books that are all about how we couldn't think of anything to do other than bring Palpatine back. This is one of the real Star Wars movies where we couldn't think of anything to do but to bring Palpatine back. <laughs> all right. Next up. Uh, man, Insomniac is busy these days because uh -huh. we got a teaser for a Wolverine game that they are making. Really, this is an announcement tease. It's like, we're yeah. making a game. There was nothing else. We don't see like what Wolverine even really looks like in this version other than he's got hairy arms and he's got the blades that come out of his knuckles. And there you go. Uh, I know they're not out of his knuckles. It's in between. It's just don't don't at me. Um <laughs> But yeah, it's uh, you know, all I really needed. This could have been a logo, a logo Insomniac's Marvel's Wolverine, and I would be like, yes, thank you, take my money. Um, yeah, this sounds good. Yeah, this was fun because this is one of those rare things that like I did not see any hint of a leak. Like I had no notion that Insomniac would be making a Wolverine game. So like when the teaser starts, because I watched this event live as it happened, um, and the teaser starts and you clock pretty quickly. 
this seems like a wolf. It's like he's like sitting in a bar. He's got the fucking cowboy hat on. You see him like from the back. Um, and it's just like, and he's wearing, you know, he's wearing like this lumberjack looking shirt. It's very fucking Wolverine or Logan. Um, and you, I, I was pretty clearly like, I think that's Wolverine. And for a moment, I was like, oh my God, is this going to be like Wolverine's going to be in the new Spider-Man game? That would be fucking crazy. And then the logo comes up and it's just its own Wolverine game, which is super exciting. Even more exciting is, um, this is where like looking at the PlayStation blog posts on these things is sometimes useful. Uh, they specifically say that this game is being headed up by the two leads of Miles Morales. So Spider-Man 2 is being, the, the main like leadership structure of Spider-Man 2 are the leads from Spider-Man 1. Um, and this is what, again, I don't think, I don't know like the rest of the staff, but they have a creative lead and a game lead position. And the creative lead and game lead of Miles Morales are working on this Wolverine game while the Spider-Man 1 leads are working on Spider-Man 2. Um, so that makes me even more excited to see what they do because it feels like Miles Morales was so good and it blew up so much. And it, it was the kind of project that studios do in order to take people and like put them in a leadership position and see how they do. And then clearly Insomniac's very satisfied with how Miles Morales did because they're just giving these guys what every indication is if you read, read that blog post, this is a full big AAA game. It's not gonna be a smaller thing like Miles Morales was. So I think yeah. that part of this is also a very cool announcement. And you know what I'm excited about is that, so it's been, a few years like Logan is like 2017 so it's been a number of years mm -hmm. since like Hugh Jackman hung up the the adamantium yeah. and we have not had like a new version of Wolverine anywhere like Marvel can use him now but there's no indication that in the immediate future they're doing a Wolverine show or like having him in an Avengers movie or something yeah. so they like, don't want to have to cross that bridge of how the fuck do you recast that role he, uh, so it's soon. gonna be hard right yeah which means Insomniac has even more mileage, I think, than they do on Spider-Man of just, mm -hmm. like, it can be anything. And I love... And, like, not that they were at all encumbered on their Spider-Man game. They did a very good job just doing their own version of Spider-Man. But I think that extra layer of freedom where, like, this is effectively going to be the next major pop culture Wolverine, Wolverine following Hugh Jackman. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. And they get to do it in this form, which is going to be a much more conducive form to that. Than a movie, even if it was a movie from the like Kevin Feige wing of Marvel, I, I think this is a, still something I'd be more excited for. So this is awesome. Yeah, and Wolverine just takes very naturally to video games in a similar way to like Spider Man is just a very yeah. good video game character. Um, like you know that X Men Origins Wolverine movie is complete garbage, but the game based on it is pretty decent. Like that's a very good third person action game for the 360 era. Um, so Wolverine has had quite a few pretty good video game appearances over the years. He's one of my favorite characters in Marvel vs. Capcom 2. Um, he's very fun to play there. Yeah. So, Do you think this yeah. is going to be like a hard M where he's just disemboweling everyone? They they did say that it's going to be like a mature tone. Like I I okay. don't think I'm not going in expecting thinking Insomniac's going to do like Last of Us Part Two style like let's oh, go God. as gory <laughs> as possible. Um, but but it's not going to be like rated t for teen wolverine i think they're going to because you can't you know his his main superpower is he has knives on his hands it's like at a certain point <laughs> it's like doing anything that isn't r in a movie or m in a video game just doesn't make sense because the only thing he could do is by punching people he's also stabbing people um so it is hard it's something like in a wolverine game on like the super nes you could get away with right yes but if you're doing it on the fucking ps5 it's going to be really hard to figure out what's the like non-violent way to use the knife on its hand yeah yeah so that's awesome but the insomniac news did not stop there sean because we also got our first trailer for marvel's spider-man 2 it's just called spider-man 2 it's gonna be hard for seo but i think it's better on the shelf uh where we get a trailer that shows very clearly that peter parker and miles morales i think will be the co-protagonist of this game yep. and venom will be the villain and they're targeting 2023 which yeah, we'll see. Um, this this is great. I love I love that. I mean, we already knew this was coming, but yeah, yeah please, Spider Man Two, I want it. Yeah, it's a very good. Just like it's a it's it's more or less a teaser trailer. Although I think the every indication is that the the footage itself is some kind of in game type footage. You know, I think this is early enough that it, it's one of those like kind of like alpha like let's like put together a like slice of the game kind of thing and see what it looks like so i think like a lot of the visuals are subject to change but it's not the wolverine thing is very clearly just a cg trailer this looks like it's it's actually running on a ps5 in some capacity 
Um, and yeah, it's a great trailer. I do, you know, I think Spider-Man 2 is absolutely like the best title of the game from a producer and marketer perspective, but I really think they should have just called it Spider-Man because it would have been so good and so funny. Oh, it would have been, yeah. Um, they, they were never going to do that, Sean, yes. but it would have been better. Yeah, yeah, it would have been better. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's it's exactly what you want for this kind of announcement trailer for this game, that it confirms very clearly that you're playing as both of them. You see, like, a takedown from Peter's perspective, and he's got, like, big, uh, like, mechanical uh, spider arms that are, like, the Iron Spider costume from the comics. And I guess he has those in the movie version also. Um, so it looks like that might be a little bit of how they kind of buff that character a bit. Uh, to make up for the fact that Miles' Venom powers are so fucking sick in Marvel, uh, Miles Morales that like I feel like you need to give Peter a little something extra that's not just his gadgets. Um, so he does a takedown with those, then Miles does a takedown with his Venom powers, and then you see like a joint takedown that kind of looks like um, Arkham Knight did some of that stuff when you fought with like Nightwing and stuff, where you kind of both characters do a big takedown. So it looks like there will be some sort of... I, I don't necessarily expect any kind of co-op, but I think some sort of, like, gameplay mechanics around using both characters together. Um, all of which, while you're getting narration that has a Russian accent that sounds a lot to me like dialogue that Craven the Hunter would be saying. So I really strongly suspect that Craven the Hunter is in this game. And then it is officially confirmed that it is Venom, because you fucking see him for a brief second. Uh, so they're doing the full venom shit i think craven's going to be there which is great because i'm well on the record as craven being one of my favorite spider-man villains and the most underrated spider-man villain because he's great but he's not in a lot of non-comic book media um and, and peter and miles like it's just like you're getting everything right you're, you're getting all the great spider-man shit throwing it in a big uh, bucket and shaking it around and i'm very excited and, well and it's not just that it's venom like they do the like black spider-man logo like yes they, uh, you, Sean, when the first Spider-Man game came out, did your whole prediction of where you thought the Spider-Man games uh -huh. were going, and it seems like you were right, is all I will say, and I am very excited also for Spider-Man 3 when we get there. <laughs> yes, uh, I'll so. need to finally get around to actually reading through all of the superior Spider-Man comic books, if it goes the way that I think it is. Yep, uh, I do, I think, I think Spider-Man would have been a good title, I think the, what they should have called this was the Spectacular Spider-Man, I think like putting uh -huh. that in front of it would make it even just like, that's perfect, but this is good too, Spider-Man 2, I'm excited, but the biggest thing that Sony showed in terms of first party stuff was definitely God of War Ragnarok, that's the official title that we knew was going to be the title to the God of War sequel, that's coming next year, um, pretty meaty trailer, like three and a half minutes showing off gameplay, showing off story stuff. We've got an older Atreus, um, not super old, but like teenage more now. Yeah. Um, and you got Kratos and it looks good. It definitely like, it looks like a very direct sequel to the first game, which is fine by me because that yes. first game is phenomenal. Um, but yeah, uh, it is, it is definitely part two of this new God of War and it looks very good and I'm very excited for it. Yeah, and it, it, it's nice that, you know, since it's clearly it is going to be like a, yeah, a, a very iterative sequel, which, like, I'm with you, like, that's kind of what I want, uh, because that first game already is the, we completely reinvented what the fuck God of War even is, so I want, like, a really, I want the God of War 2 to last 2018's God of War, because God of War 2 was a lot like that, it was, like, iterative, but it just, like, tuned everything perfectly because they had this, like, incredible base to build off of, um... And yeah, it's just a very nice, meaty gameplay trailer. And I appreciate that, um, that, you know, the a lot of the stuff in the event from Sony was more like Wolverine and Spider-Man 2, where you're getting stuff that's clearly like a long time in before it comes out. This, I, you know, I wouldn't be shocked if it ends up getting delayed a bunch because of COVID and everything. But I also would not be surprised if this does land like fall 2022, which looks like that seems like that would be a reasonable window for it based on like the gameplay trailer and how much they show and how much it looks like a straight up fucking video game um yeah it's like it's just a solid trailer for a very cool looking game i did find it funny that when so when the trailer starts you get some dialogue from atreus and i had this weird moment of being like why did they recast atreus and it's like he sounds completely different and then i had this moment of like wait he was played by a literal child actor in the first game, and I just looked it up really quick. It's like, okay, yeah, no, it is the same kid. It's just in the first game, he was like 12, and now he's like 16. So, yeah, no shit, he sounds totally different. But it works because it's great because it's like he's actually an adolescent in the game. Um, and so having him be voiced by an actual teenager, um, that's cool. Like, I feel like you don't hear that a lot. It's a, like, 
there, I don't think there are lots of voice actors that are like 15 to 18 year old boys because of how like awkward like the voice change stuff can be and it's really cool to kind of just say no we're just sticking with the character his voice changed we're just rolling with it yeah no I think that's cool I think it's a good good move and I had the same, same exact reaction Sean was like oh I, I wonder who they got for Atreus and it's like no, I think I think that's the same guy. It's just he grew up a little bit. Yeah, <laughs> that happens. Happens to all of us. All right, what else do we have here? Um, Sean, are you looking forward to Tiny Tina's Wonderlands? No, this Kotaku thing says Tiny Tina's Wonderlands looks like a great time. I disagree. That looks like the Borderlands. No. As as time has gone on, I felt like Borderlands One was a game that was like deeply out of touch and just like felt like from a decade earlier like it's so trying to be like a oh, wacky crazy 90s adventure bro um that's like the tone of borderlands it's like we're gonna do some mad max references that's sick right bro like that's the whole tone of borderlands and it sucked then it sucked all that shit sucked in borderlands 2 um i didn't play borderlands 3 but i'm sure it sucked there uh and it sucks in this trailer uh i hate the tone and style of borderlands so much and i just do not want to watch trailers of these games anymore yeah i watched about five seconds of that trailer and i went i don't have to and i turned it off because who yep. fucking cares uh let's see project eve was revealed that is a game from someone i actually don't know what this is i think it's basically it looks like i think the game is korean it might be chinese okay uh, I, I didn't look up the the developer i had the impression that it seemed korean um, but it, it looks like basically very devil may cry-esque uh it's like third person action game um, this like lady fighting big demon monsters and stuff. It seemed pretty cool. Like it, it's a pretty meaty gameplay trailer um, yes. that is going to be a next gen exclusive. So I'm, I'm curious to see more of that because it's cool to just see something that's like I have no idea what the fuck this is. Uh, but it, I, I like third person action games, so I'm it, it, it put it on my radar. We are getting Uncharted ports for PS5. Uncharted 4 and Uncharted The Lost Legacy are getting ported to PS5 as the Legacy of Thieves collection. Um, that trailer was clearly at 60 FPS and it'll have all the bells and whistles. And then those are also going to be on PC, yep. but not Uncharted 1 through 3. So if you have a PS5, this is great because then Uncharted 1 and through 3 on the Nathan Drake collection are already in like 4k 60 yeah they don't really need anything and then you'll get four and five up to that level and you can put them on the shelf together um but if you're on pc and you don't have any playstation you can play four and five but not one two three which is weird but okay yeah i i suspect it's just that thing of where that's probably a lot of work to port those games and they are very old like i it would be awesome for them too but i'm also not surprised that they're not going to port uncharted right. one through three um, but it would be, it's just it would like be. the choices of what they are and aren't pointing to PC for Sony is just bizarre and haphazard and that's more what's yeah. odd to me it, it feels to me like they're kind of going for this like first party games from about three to four years ago like is kind of that window they're like they it feels like they're testing that water and but don't want to try to step on the toes of like more recent first party games but I, I, I hope and suspect that that's going to accelerate more to getting more like recent stuff out on there like um like one thing they really should do is get the last of us remastered and last of us 2 um if they're doing yeah. like that collection and stuff like that like that rumored like full remake or whatever the fuck maybe they're doing the last of us um and getting those on pc would also be very smart all right uh rainbow six extraction is a thing i don't care uh i can't believe i had to watch another fucking trailer for that game after ubisoft movies sit through like 40 minutes of it in their goddamn e3 thing uh, here's something I really like. Yes. We got a Square Enix game called Forspoken, um, which we learned later. This is the game Amy Hennig is working on. Yes. Um, and this game looks awesome. It's basically like an isekai story mm -hmm. where you have a girl who's like, kind of like, she's got a cool cat and she's trying to make it in the big city or something. And then she gets transported to a fantasy land. It's a little like never ending story also. And like, then she's in this big fantasy land and she has like this magic bracelet and she's going around doing cool shit. It looks great gorgeous and big and cool and i am very down for this this looks awesome sean yeah because this is something because this was um project athea i think is what it used to be called like because they had shown this a couple of times and i think we knew the title by this point but i don't remember but this is like the meatiest trailer we've seen for it and yeah it looks great like 
the story has these like really great like YA novel vibes to me uh, that I I like. It's kind of reminds me a little bit of like Horizon Zero Dawn in that way. Of I've it feels like Hollywood got burned on their like obsessive adaptation of like YA novel trilogies that then split the third book into four into two. That's what movies. did them in was the specifically yeah. the splitting them up and yeah. yeah. They were very obsessive with all that shit, and they kind of, like, killed themselves on the YA stuff. Meanwhile, like, YA in novels and literature is still, like, massively popular. It's still, like, the bulk of sales in books. And it feels like video games are kind of catching on to, hey, we can take some of these, like, kind of storytelling styles and trends that YA stuff does and do them in video games. And you can get some really cool stories. So Horizon is very much like a YA story. This looks super like that to me. Uh, and and I that's awesome. Like, it just is very refreshing to watch this trailer and be like oh my god this is a kind of story you just don't see that much in video games even though it is very nicely acclimated to a video game landscape um i and it just looks gorgeous too it's clearly a like it's a ps5 like it's a next gen exclusive i think it's a timed exclusive for ps5 yeah that's what the kotaku thing says here um so it's it's looks like a proper next gen thing and i'm i'm pretty excited for it like the world is so big, I get very like Final Fantasy fifteen vibes from it, which yeah. I in the world design I love unabashedly, so that's very cool. Um Alan Wake is getting a remaster. We already knew that. Yes. Um, but we got a little trailer and I hear that game is good. Yeah, I'm very excited for that because uh control fucking rules and that that and Alan Wake is in the like second big DLC thing they did for that and that character seemed cool and interesting. So I'm I, I will definitely check this out because Yep. I, I'm I'm on the remedy train. I want to see what they do. I I hope that they do like, um, just based on the Alan Wake expansion. I hope they have like a big crazy like Spider Man two. I want to play as Alan Wake and uh, 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 Jaden, the main character from Control, in the next uh, remedy game because those games are sick. Yep, uh, Grand Theft Auto Five is coming in March. It was going to come in November. Now it's coming in March. I don't care. Ghostwire Tokyo was delayed to 2022. We already knew that. It got another little trailer. It still looks cool. Uh, Deathloop is coming. That's a game. Guardians of the Galaxy is a Death game. Deathloop comes out like next week, I think. That game. Oh, I'm, it does? I'm very excited to see reviews for that because I think that game might be right up my alley. But yeah, it's like very soon. Nice. It's definitely in September. Yeah. And then there's a couple other things here, like Gran Turismo 7 got its release date. But I don't know if there's anything else of interest from this show. But th there is a lot. I do want to shout out this game, if you scroll a bit, Jonathan, of the Kotaku thing, uh, Chia, uh, T-C-I-A. Oh, yeah, 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 that looked cool. That, yeah. that was a very nice trailer of where it's it looks like a kind of like bigger scale indie kind of game, like a big indie sort of game. But there was something about that trailer where I, I tend to get very exhausted by the kind of tropey nature of a lot of indie game trailers. But that one, um, it stood out to me a lot. And, and I thought that was pretty, pretty cool. Yeah, the location especially seems really nice yeah. that they're kind of drawing from. So, okay, I'm sorry I overlooked that one. That looks great, yeah. Um, alrighty, so that's the news. Good PlayStation stuff. Nice to see them doing all of that. And and honestly, seeing a couple of previews of stuff that are going to be genuine PS5 exclusives because, as we've talked about, it seems like we're still going to be in cross-platform territory throughout next year. But yeah. it seems like they're pretty clearly targeting like 2023. By then, we're going to be all on the PS5 train and... Hopefully, the chip shortage will be done by then. You know, hopefully, the world is still around at that point. It's like, even though I know rationally, since we're in mid-September in 2021, like, 2023 is not actually, like, that far away, because we're getting very close to it being 2022. Um, but it feels still like an impossible time that cannot ever exist. Like, the idea of, like, what the fuck will the world even look like by 2023 I have no idea. Bad. It'll look bad. Uh huh. It'll look bad. Will it look worse than now? I don't know. Probably, but it'll be bad. You're probably um, right. Yeah. Anyway, let's talk about something good. Let's transition Sean into talking about the latest Marvel movie, Shang Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings. And I would say not just one of the latest, but one of the greatest. I think this is one of Marvel's finest hours. This is a damn good movie, Sean. Yeah, this this might be, like, I think it is in contention for the best Marvel movie. Like, it is, I would put it up there with Thor Ragnarok and Black Panther as being, like, a... This is just a fucking damn good movie. And certainly, um, as, like, an origin movie, it's right there with, like, Black Panther as feeling... Holy shit. Like, it's just such a great introduction yeah. to the world and the character. And really kind of, in many ways, a very deep reinvention of a lot of stuff around Shang-Chi, which is 
I think, pretty necessary, uh, but also uh, cool. Uh, like, this is... This feels more of a radical departure from, like, the comic book stuff for the character than I've seen in other Marvel movies, um, but in a way that is very good. Of Like, they kind of have reinvented a little bit of Shang-Chi uh, in a way that is sick, and, and I, I enjoyed the hell out of this movie. Yeah, I think I, I would put it at least a notch below, like, the very top of, like, the Thor Ragnarok Black Panther, just because there's a couple of nagging issues with me for the movie. But uh, certainly having watched it a second time, a lot of that melted away, and... Overall, I think, you know, there are two axes on which this movie works really, really well. And that is, one, it is a genuinely very good family drama story. Mm -hmm. And I think you have a lot of that to thank uh, Destin Daniel Cretton for, the director of this movie, who, if you have not seen his first film, Short Term 12, which is also the first time I really noticed Brie Larson as an actress, um, you should watch Short Term 12 because it's amazing. Uh, and he just makes movies that are, are do this kind of thing very well. And I think as a director in Shang-Chi, he really gives that family drama room to like feel meaningful. And he gives the actors, especially Tony Leung, room yeah. to work. And that makes all the difference in the world. And then on the other side, this has the best action in any Marvel yeah. movie by miles and miles and miles and miles. Because if it is not on par quite with like the Jackie Chan and Zhang Yimou influences it's drawing from, it is really trying hard to do that thing. And just by, like, it could be much worse than it actually is. And just by virtue of trying, I think it would be better than most like modern Hollywood action. Um, outside of like a John Wick or something and by virtue of trying and actually doing it very well thanks in parts to the contributions of the late Brad Allen who is the yeah. uh, stunt coordinator who who passed away shortly after the completion of this movie and the movie is dedicated to um, it is a really convincing simulacrum of these things and you put those two together and that is peanut butter and jelly and it works very well and it is just a very fun time at the movies yeah, it, it's like kind of I think the 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 best possible outcome for Shang Chi. And the thing I was like really excited about and why I've kind of wanted a Shang Chi movie for a while is because it's just an opportunity to do a kung fu superhero movie because that's what Shang Chi is, right? He comes from like the early seventies in the comics in that period after Bruce Lee died because you know Bruce Lee died like right when his movies came out, and so he was like it was this brief spark of like huge popularity that then he died and you know, it became this like posthumous incredible boom. And that created this phase of like Bruce exploitation where you made all people made these like just trashy, awful Kung Fu movies starring people like Bruce Lee, but spelled L I instead of L E E and stuff like that. And this comes from that period of time where the idea was, let's just take Bruce Lee basically, which is what Shang-Chi's character originally was and put him in a superhero comic book. Um, so the idea of it's just a Kung Fu superhero is the core of the character and this is like that, but made by people who actually know what like kung fu movies are and like yes. respect <laughs> the tradition and the culture and wuxia and stuff like that and put all of those elements in there. And so all like the cinematic tradition of the kung fu genre and, and it's sort of like other, you know, related genres like wuxia all kind of coalesce here while still having the kind of like the fun, poppy superhero element to it. It's just such a rich fusion of different genres that go together very well um and it's a thing that marvel has done on a, a bunch of their better movies like the winter soldier and stuff like that where they kind of fuse superhero stuff with another genre i think this is the most successful genre fusion they've had because i think some of those kung fu scenes particularly the bus scene near the beginning of the movie are like just incredible and and is the kind of thing where as you say, it's not as good as, like, the real deal as, like, a Donnie Yen or a Jackie Chan movie, but it's pretty damn fucking close and a lot closer than Hollywood basically ever gets. Yeah, outside of something like a John Wick that is, like, expressly made in that direction. Yeah. Which is really, that's more of, like, kind of the Hong Kong gun fu kind of tradition sort of thing. But, like, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's very good on that level. It's just... And, and, you know, because I actually think something like The Winter Soldier was, like, refreshing at the time. I think you go back and look at it and it's pretty clear, like... It's gesturing in that direction more than it's really doing it. Mm -hmm. um, and, like, this is doing more than gesturing. Like, that, I, th I think this movie's opening, where it, like, lays out all the mythology and stuff, is one of the best openings to a Marvel movie. And that yeah. initial sort of, like, flirtatious battle that Tony Leung and, uh, and the, the mom, I don't want to just call her the mom, but I forget her name, but the woman who becomes Shang-Chi's mom, 
they have is like which is very taken from like a like house of flying daggers or like yes. a Zheng Yimou kind of like modern wuxia thing uh crouching tiger hidden dragon obviously would be another like touchstone there and it's like it's actually a really well i think it does honestly i think it might do like some of the wuxia stuff even better than it does some of like the kung fu stuff because the wuxia stuff is already a little more special effects heavy and so mm-hmm. like there's a way to do that that like fits into this milieu a little more but it's so beautiful and then almost immediately you have that fight on the bus which is just pure like Jackie Chan enthusiasm right where it's like yes. this environmental action sequence that's funny and silly and big and over the top um and and they're just kind of bouncing between all these different influences but doing them well like where like I'm noticing nods to movies where I'm like this isn't the deepest cut but this is a way deeper cut than I thought Hollywood would ever make, you know? And that's kind of a consistent thing here that's that's really cool to see. Um, the 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 big sign, of course, being that they got Tony Leung for this. And we'll yeah. talk about that because, holy shit, they really uh-huh. got him. Um, but yeah, this this movie slaps. This is great. Yeah, this is, this is a very good, like, this is a very fun movie theater movie. Like, it, it, it was very satisfying to have this be the first movie I've seen in the theater since... Kimetsu no Yaiba because it was just a like you know you get that feeling of like everybody's here it's you know this big crowd pleaser kind of movie so you, you just have that energy of everybody's really loving the movie everyone's laughing at the jokes um everyone's excited by the action it's just like it's it is you know there's a lot of stuff to be very cynical about with the Marvel Cinematic Universe stuff um particularly like Disney's like slow corporate takeover of all of American culture but there is still something to be extracted of value from that like experience of being we can all be people that like a thing together and that's like a it, it is it is a nice glimmer of like hey humans can be happy um and that's a thing that is hard to feel uh, in 2021 in a lot of ways uh and this movie just being so full of life and energy and having this great story with really great characters and great action um it, it was a very very fun experience Oh, 100%. And I think this is like, this is also Marvel's sweet spot where it's very yeah. character driven and it's very sort of fanciful. And so it's not getting into the problems of something like uh, Falcon and the Winter Soldier where it's broaching political issues that it, it, like, in no world can possibly actually talk about. Yeah. You know? Um, and like, Black Panther, like, is elevated because it's like a very good version of that. Um, but, like, that's kind of been the exception not to rule for Marvel and, like, trying to broach real-world issues. So I think this is this is definitely their sweet spot. And it is, you know, I, I think the thing that struck me watching it a second time, and both times with an audience that was really enjoying it, and as you say, that's part of the fun, um, is that it just, this movie is almost entirely new characters. There's, like, one or two returning cameos and cast members. Um, and it just builds a really great ensemble that I think at the end of this movie the whole world is excited to see more of. Um, and that's awesome. That's that's something we haven't seen from Marvel in a while. Um, because even if they've had some like new solo movies like Captain Marvel, I, I, Captain Marvel's okay, but I don't think anyone comes out of that going, I need five more of these. I think Shang-Chi feels like we just blew the doors off this fucking world and I want a bunch more, you know? Yeah, because Captain Marvel is also like kind of a two-hander with Nick Fury, which is part yeah. of like what's fun about that movie, but it also like centers it very heavily in like the mcu stuff um whereas you say here with like shang chi i mean you know out, outside of like the fun ben kingsley stuff which i think probably actually in some ways i almost think that stuff might work better for you if you didn't know it because it would like you wouldn't be seeing it as a reference it would just be like a goofy thing that happens in the movie um other than that like you need not watch anything and you wouldn't miss anything about this movie like it's just it's just a cool big action kung fu movie. Like you don't need to have watched a hundred Captain Americas or anything like that to 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 enjoy this film. Yeah, they they have their one like every Marvel movie now has to make one reference to that the snap happened. We're not actually gonna do anything with it, but we have to make a reference to it. But like unlike some of the Disney Plus shows, it's not like every five minutes they're making a reference yeah. to the snap. It's just that we have our one and then we move on and tell our story. And yeah, that was that was honestly very deeply refreshing about this. It is it is so its own thing. Um, and I love that. And, you know, definitely, you know, as you say, like in terms of their origin story movies, this is just so much more confident, but also expansive than anything back from like phase one, you know? Yeah. And that's really cool to see. So where do you want to start with Shang-Chi? There is, there's a lot of good stuff to break down here. I, I do want to like, cause we talked about it a little bit, but let's just dive into that opening sequence because that's where like, 
I think the you get so much buy-in, especially if you're people like us that you like have this affection for the stuff they're referencing. That that opening scene is just fucking incredible. And and the thing I really want to stand up and applaud the movie for is that there's a solid like thirty to forty percent of the dialogue in the movie is just straight up fucking Chinese, just yes. with subtitles. No, it takes oh like God. fifteen minutes to get an English line in this movie, and I have seen that that's meant a lot to people who like are you know in an Asian American diaspora where they speak Mandarin or something. That I, I've seen some really good articles on this from people being like, "There's so much more of that than I thought." Like, because it's not just like long stretches of subtitled. It's also just they'll mix it in with dialogue. Yes. Like when you're at um, the Aquafina character's home and it's just sort of bouncing back and forth. Ronnie Chang during his part where they're at the like arena has a lot of just he's putting in like Chinese slang and stuff like that. And it's really cool. And yeah, I think when when I realized like, oh, they're gonna do their whole like Lord of the Rings style intro, but they're gonna do it entirely in Chinese. Thank you. That's awesome. That like just adds this like immediate layer of authenticity and buy-in, hopefully for everyone. It's awesome. Yeah, and and it's where you just get this feeling of like, ha, ah, fuck all you people. Like now you have to read the subtitles. Like like foreign <laughs> movies are good. Like it's, yes. it's fine watching a movie with subtitles is totally fine. And now you're like, haha, we've tricked you. You're now watching a movie with subtitles, and guess what? You're enjoying it because you can read, and it's fine. Um, and it does like. It adds so much authenticity immediately, and it's it's one of my biggest pet peeves with anything like this is is when a thing is set in a place, and then all of a sudden everyone's like speaking English, and they have like British accents or something for no apparent reason, and that kind of thing. It adds this just unimpassable wall of artifice around the entire story and the characters. Um, you know, it's, it's like the reason why the notion of playing a game like Ghost of Tsushima with the English dub is just inconceivable to me. Because it's like, it's, it's Japan. It's set in Japan. These are Japanese people. They should be speaking Japanese because it's the culture and like language is like one of the most, if not the most fundamental thing to a culture is the language that you write and the language that you speak. Um, and so them pulling all that in and committing to it for this movie. And as you say, that opening like 15 minutes or so is straight, just only Chinese. Um, and then it's interspersed throughout. So it's not a thing where you will sometimes see that where they might in the opening, they'll do it a little bit and then they just never comes up again. Uh, cause they kind of like feels like, oh, we paid our like foreign language price. Now we can just do the movie without it. This it's a piece of the characters and it's like how they talk. Um, it's a part of who they are, particularly with characters like Shang-Chi, who is bilingual, um, or Xiaoling, who's also his sister, who's also bilingual, right? That they mix it in and it's a part of their dialect. Um, it, it's, it's just such a fundamentally necessary part of telling a story like this. And yet it's so often not done that it shouldn't be surprising and satisfying when you see it done well, but it absolutely is. Yeah, and stuff like, you know, Tony Leung getting to give quite a bit of this performance in Chinese. Like, a lot of yeah. it is in English, and I do love his English voice because he sounds vaguely Werner Herzogian. Yes, he does. A and it's great. Uh, uh -huh. He's got that kind of, like, raspy quality, That's uh, but he's also kind of playful with it. I love it. But it's also, like, you meet the character speaking his native tongue. Like, that's yeah. an important thing, and it's cool. And, yeah, and that opening sequence, beyond just the coolness of actually doing it in Chinese... It's such a great, like, version of the lore dump scene. Like, mm -hmm. it is so fun. It's so playful. The Ten Rings are immediately very cool. And then you have that whole fight scene in the garden that's very, like, Crouching Tiger or House of Flying Daggers. Kind of like the modern sort of, like, reinvention of Wuxia with, like, Ang Lee and Zhang Yimou. But it's, like, and it's beautiful. It's, like, there's there's there are swaths of this movie where I think the cinematography and the color work is, like, kind of dull. But, like, there's moments where you can tell they really, like, worked on it and this that's one of them and i think that opening fight between the two of them and how like the director destin daniel cretton is very not smart about how like fight choreography can do character work and you don't need dialogue for certain things if you can have people like doing this like acrobatic fighting um and that's one of those scenes that just fucking nails it yeah it just tells the whole story of these two characters meeting which is like the heart of this story is this relationship between Tony Leung's character and uh, Ying Li is the name of, of, of his wife. Um, because obviously that's where then Shang-Chi and his sister come from and it's about their relationship and then uh, uh, the mother dying and that sort of, you know, setting the whole plot in motion. And so you have to sell that because it's the heart of the movie 
And it's really powerful to sell it entirely through action and motion and and like filmic language in the perform the physical performance of these two actors. Um, and this that's also where immediately um, the score of this movie is like way better than your like not just like Marvel scores, which oftentimes are sort of like whatever, but most Hollywood movie scores I think like these days just don't really do anything for me. And the music we're in a by, real rut, and this is great. Yeah, the music by Joel P. West, like immediately there's lots of really great light motifs and stuff like that that they start establishing very early on, and it just feels like if you're watching a fucking movie with a movie soundtrack, uh, it's just immediately the movie makes the best possible impression. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, after that, I also love that this movie does not have, like, the sort of, like, slow Marvel first act you sometimes uh-huh. get. It is you meet adult Shang-Chi, going by Sean, in San Francisco. You have a quick scene of him at work with Aquafina, and then a scene at, their, at her house where the, we kind of see her family and what their relationship is like. And then they're on the bus, and the plot happens. And it's like, it's such a, like, light-on-its-feet, fast, fleet-footed version of that. Um, getting you sort of right to the good stuff while not, you know, cutting corners on the character work. And I think part of that is just the strength of our two leads here, Simu Liu and then uh, and Aquafina are great together and they make an impression yeah. and you don't need to overdo it. Um, that's great. That's something there's, I do think there's some pacing issues around the middle of the movie, but this part is really, really well done. Yeah, this is where I think some of like the Kung Fu movie influence you can feel in its structure and pacing because this, this is very much how a Kung Fu movie builds its plot right like you you're trying to get to that first big action beat as efficiently as possible because that's where you sell the people on the movie because it's a kung fu movie um and yeah the efficiency with which they establish you know shang chi's life uh in san francisco and him being a valet and and him sort of hiding who he is and and not living up to his potential it establishes all of its themes really effectively um that you know you don't realize it at the time but like probably like the most thematically resonant sequence in that whole opening is actually the scene with uh katie's or aquafina's character's grandmother um with the her husband right the grandfather of katie has passed away at some point in the past and it's a day of remembrance and she the grandmother kind of talks about all that and that is setting up Right, that then is called back to at the very end of the movie because it's all about learning to live with your past and let go of the past and things like that. Um, and so it's super efficient about picking out three or four scenes to have. Every scene performs a really important character function, a really important thematic function, and then you get on a bus and you have the sickest fucking fight in any Marvel movie. Uh, that's a good. That's a good first act to a film. Absolutely. So let's talk about that bus scene. And right away, I do want to call out um, the late Brad Allen, yeah. who who passed away. And he is, I believe, the only Westerner who ever became a part of the Jackie Chan stunt team. So yeah. he worked with Jackie Chan on a lot of uh, his, his stuff, um, including some of his American stuff, like the Rush Hour movies. Uh, and then sort of went back to Hollywood and he did a bunch of stuff. And you look at his, like, his, basically he's usually uh, credited as action coordinator. And I'm just looking at his list of credits. And there's some really great stuff on here. Hellboy 2, uh, uh, Scott Pilgrim vs. the World, The Adventures of Tintin, Pacific Rim, uh, all the Kingsman movies. Which actually means he has one more movie coming out. The Kingsman prequel, The Kingsman, is coming out this year. And that's the last movie he worked on. Um, Solo, a Star Wars story, Wonder Woman. There's a lot of good stuff on here. But I think, honestly, looking at the list of stuff, like he was sort of a lead on this in, I think Shang-Chi is like the most he ever got to cut loose because especially the bus fight scene, that is a Jackie Chan scene. Like that is fully and completely, that is like, the only thing that really separates it is that it's clearly on a green screen with CGI and stuff. But like, overall, like it is the idea of, of you get in an environment and you use every fucking tool and you make it kind of silly, but also like so kinetic and engaging that it just kind of blows you back in your seat. Um, it is one of the better like versions of a, let's do a Jackie Chan thing. I've ever seen someone not Jackie Chan do. Yeah. 100%. It's like the whole, every beat, the pacing of it is so, so smart. You know, they do because they build in little moments and i feel like that's like the the hong kong thing that a lot of hollywood movies don't do is they like kind of just get what in like a hong kong movie you would call as filler which is basically just shots of people punching and kicking and you just do some of those and it's like those are like filler shots where you're kind of building those between your moments but a fight scene is constructed of like clear 
effective story beats um, that are communicated through action that reflect something about the characters. And there are lots and lots of really great story beats throughout that whole fight scene. Like one I think that is I, I particularly liked is before the fight starts, Katie and Shang-Chi look at, um, there's like another woman on the bus and they she's on a laptop writing a yes. research report or whatever. They're like, oh, look at this lady writing a research report on the bus. Like, oh, look at me. It's like they do that thing. Um, and then in the middle of the fight, he's fighting Razor Fist, uh, Loki, the best character in the movie. I love fucking Razor Fist so much. Um, he's fighting Razor Fist, and then he grabs that lady's laptop and uses it to break Razor Fist, block Razor Fist, Razor Fist. Um, and then he like gives it back to the lady. He's like, sorry about that, and goes back to fighting. And that's that kind of Jackie Chan energy you want, where you have set up an idea for a prop and like a... a a moment in the fight and then later in the fight you get back to that moment and there's a clarity to the character and the movement and the meaning behind those sequences that even something small like that a lot of thought and care and like filmmaking talent has to go into making that beat work so well and the fight that fight scene in particular which i think is clearly the most complicated it's clearly the one that they spent the most work on like with the setup and all of that there's so much that goes into it it's got dozens and dozens of great beats like that throughout the whole fight yeah, I was going to bring up the laptop thing too because that's like the most Jackie Chan-esque moment yes. in it because I can just I can just see young Jackie Chan in like the 80s doing the turn to the woman with like the broken laptop and doing like the sheepish grin, you know? Yeah. I can just see that in my head. And Simu Liu, his performance is a little more down to earth. He's not as much of a goofball as a Jackie Chan, but he gets that same sort of energy there. And yeah, and just like how it uses like the bars of the bus that he's like going between and it's like almost like monkey bars at a certain point. Mm -hmm. You know, where he's like going between very acrobatically. Um, it's great. It's such, and it's such a cool like announcement of our hero. And you know, what occurred to me, what's so cool about this movie, watching it a second time, is that until the very end of the movie, when he gets the Ten Rings, Shang-Chi is not a superhero. Yeah. He's not like, he is in the same way like, you know, Bruce Lee and Jackie Chan are superheroes and that no one can quite really do these things. But like, his superpower is he trained a lot. You know? And, like, that's really fucking cool. And I love that, like, all the stuff he's doing is because he just trained a lot. And he's really good at it. And it's that great, like, martial arts movie quality. And that's what's so fun about it. Yeah, 100%. Um, and, and, you know, like, you've got to give mad props to Simu Liu for, oh, like... Man. He's fucking doing the shit, man. Like, it's... Because he has a background in martial arts um, and stuff like that. And, and like, he is clearly doing a, like most of if not almost like all of like his fight and stunt work particularly in those big fight scenes because it's it's him right like they it gives them the freedom to be able to frame the fight and shoot the fight however the fuck they want because they yes. don't have to worry about cutting to a weird shot for a stunt man or like having to worry about doing like a digital double kind of thing or anything like that it's like no Fucking Simu Liu is out there he's doing the shit he's fucking jumping flipping around kicking people in the face um, and if you can't have your main like leads that are in those action scenes just be the actors doing those stunts, like you can't do the Hong Kong style. Like that's one of the reasons why Hollywood action often sucks is because the action star d either can't or doesn't want to um, do those stunts and do those fights because they're not physically capable enough to do it. Um, and if you have that situation, you just can't shoot this, the, the, the scene well. Here, you just see this man doing this shit the whole way through, and it's fucking awesome. Yeah, it, it, the movie would fall apart. Like, there's, There would be no way to do this if you did not have the, the leading man who could both act, you know, the part, but also, like, do the work. And yeah. it's great. And, like, Simu Liu, immediately one of my favorite people in the MCU. He's, like... It's, it's not a super showy performance in a lot of ways, and I think part of that is, like, the construction of the story is that he's a fairly internalized character, mm -hmm. but I still walked away like, you know, this is a star-making performance. He's yes. great in this. You know? Yeah, but, yeah, he's got this, like, immediate charisma on screen, and as you say, with, with a very internalized performance of, like, I'm very excited to watch the movie again, to, to watch those early moments again, because you don't realize like how much that character is hurting until you get to that, at least that midpoint of the movie, you've kind of seen all the shit he's been through. And so much of the movie is about untangling that ball, right? Because it's not like it deep until the third act that you find out all the stuff of like, he did go through with killing the guy who killed his mother and all that kind of like the nature of how his mother died, all that stuff. The movie plays that really slow 
And so, so much of the character is, is internal and I think he conveys it incredibly well. Yeah. And you know, this was one of the pleasures of me going to see the movie a second time was just studying that performance. There's the scene where he's giving the backstory on the plane to Mm -hmm. Katie and she asks, like, did you go through with it? And if you if you haven't seen the movie, you're with her. You don't know. If you've seen the movie, you know he did go through with it. He killed the guy. And if you watch Simu Liu, he's playing that. Like, it's mm-hmm. it's really clear on his face. And it's something that I really love that Destin Daniel Cretton does through this whole movie. Is that when the moments call for it, he just lets the actor play the moment. And, yeah. like, let, let, let it sit and let the face do the work. It's often without dialogue, like in that scene where he's like figuring out how he's going to answer Katie. And we don't cut, we don't put in a gag, we just like let it, there's other gags in that scene, but in that moment, just like let the actor work. He does this with Tony Leung all over the movie, because if you don't stand back and let Tony Leung do his thing, why the hell do you hire him? Um, But like, it's true, like all the actors get those moments. And it is something that I think really separates this from the pack, because I do think a lot of, a lot of Marvel movies tend, to, and just Hollywood movies in general, tend to be very high on incident, and we move very fast, and there's not a lot of scenes where actors sit down and really act. Like, there's often scenes where they get to be charismatic, and maybe they get to bounce off of other actors and have fun, but just that general, just, like, sit down and act, that's something that blew me away about Loki. I love that Loki yeah. has all those scenes where, like, you just get Tom Hiddleston in a room with Owen Wilson, or with the uh, the female lead of that show, I forget the actress's name, but who plays um, the other, the female Loki, and just like just let them act and i love that and i think this movie does it very frequently and you know that 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 is a counterpart in a lot of great haunt like uh, uh kung fu movies too yes is that you know bruce lee's a good actor and it's not just about watching him do his thing uh fighting it's also about like what can we do in a scene and jackie chan's the same way and certainly in wuxia movies that's really crucial which this is also very heavily drawing from yeah because it's you need that stuff for the action to be meaningful, right? Because it's not just yeah. it's not just about having cool stunts and the cool choreography. It's all based around the story and the character that you're trying to convey, right? So one of the things that's great about that bus action scene is that it's telling the story of a character that you don't think is going to be like the master of kung fu as his you know namesake in the comic books. Um, you think it's just like, oh, this is just a dude who's going about his life and he's a valet or whatever. And he's kind of, you know, he does, he's not very ambitious. He's just hanging out with this girl he knows in college. Um, and they're like not really dating, but they, because it feels like they're maybe scared to push a relationship or anything like that. And he's just like, this is just the life he's leading. And then all of a sudden he's doing fucking bicycle kicks and shit like that. And that reveal and the like story that is being told there of you peeling back those layers that realize oh he is like not only is he like does he know some like karate or kung fu or taekwondo or whatever the styles he's using it's like he is an absolute master like he is fearless um and and that moment where at the end of that whole sequence aquafina looks at him and just says who are you like, that's the story that is being told to you in that scene, and that's why that scene's so effective. It's not just this cool stunts. It's always based in the story and the characters. And so you need to have those shorter, more, like, um, quiet, powerful character moments and let the actors play in order to give the action the meaning that it has. Yes, absolutely. So should we should we just talk about the the Tony Leung of it all? Yeah, it's kind of impossible not to just be like, <laughs> let's just talk about you know one of the world's greatest actors just being like, yo, <laughs> I'm in this fucking Marvel movie. Like, what's up? I mean, if you don't know who Tony Leung is, um, he is he's the best actor who's ever been in a Marvel movie. I'm not going to argue about yeah. that. He just is. Like, if you look at his body of work, he is probably the most significant actor of his generation out of Hong Kong and his generation out of Hong Kong is like one of the most significant generations yeah. in movie history um you know I think probably best known in the west for his work with Wong Kar Wai, Chunking Express, Happy Together, In the Mood for Love but he worked with everybody in the day you know um he's in John Woo movies and he's in he's in Hard Boiled he's in Infernal Affairs which yeah. is the inspiration for The Departed um he's in A City of Sadness he's done stuff with Ang Lee um he's worked with everybody he's never been in a Hollywood movie and I remember when this, like, when they announced it, because we, we, we talked about it on the podcast, that, oh my god, they cast Tony Leung as someone who 
is analogous to the Mandarin. He's not the Mandarin. We'll talk about why. Because we don't... Yeah, yeah. We'll talk know. about all the influences that go into this character and how deftly they just say, oh, let's just do our own thing. Yes, exactly, exactly. Um, but, like, and I think you and I were both pretty surprised because that is arguably the biggest name they've ever gotten for a Marvel thing. Like, you yeah. know, Robert Downey Jr. is a big star now, but he was kind of washed up when he got the Iron Man role. And if you if you think globally, like who are stars for the global population of planet Earth, Tony Leung is one of the biggest on the planet. And, you know, my fear is always with something like this, you know, because Hollywood does this from time to time. They will get a major Asian star and put them in their movie, mostly so they can market it in China or something. Yeah. And then they don't use them. I The one I always think of is Chow Yun-Fat in Pirates of the Caribbean 3. Where oh, like God, yeah. He was heavily marketed as part of that movie. And he's in, like, two scenes and barely talks. And, like, just the flagrant disrespect for major Asian stars that you get in Hollywood movies all the time. We talked about this with Ken Watanabe in Batman yes. Begins. Like, and I don't know if Ken Watanabe was a huge star at that point. But he's fucking Ken Watanabe. You look at the dude and you're like, this is a movie star. Um, and he doesn't even get to talk in that movie, you know, and so I was a little worried, and it's so much more than I could have expected, because he is the major antagonist of this movie, but he's also kind of the heart of the movie, like, it, it's almost like his story as much as it is Shang-Chi's, and, like, Destin Daniel Cretton goes out of his way to give Tony Lang room to, like, show America why he's the best actor in the world, you know, yeah. like, this is, I think, I think just on the level of, like, raw acting craft... This is probably the best performance in a Marvel movie. It's amazing. I yeah no I one hundred percent agree because it, it is also like a very like meaty character for him to play because yeah. it feels like like the it feels like that character was written for Tony Leung like it feels like they wouldn't have gone for like this big swing of how both like deeply sympathetic the character is and also how like fucking terrifying the character is. Like, you wouldn't try to go for something that's that, like, sort of big a swing on your, like, main antagonist for a movie if you weren't going to get an actor that could pull it off. Because it is, like, a, I think a very, like, delicate balance act that he has to play. Of that he is, like, scary as shit. Um, you know, there's that great scene where he comes back in, um, you know, and, like, where he, like, captures Shang-Chi and his sister. Um, and, and Aquafina later is talking to the sister. It's just, like that is like the scariest dude I've ever seen in my life, right? Like, like <laughs> he's, he's terrifying, but he's not terrifying in like a standard movie villain way. It is this way where the character feels like truly sociopathic. Um, like he feels like when he looks at his children, he kind of can't see them. Um, and that is like, it's like really haunting. But at the same time, you also see the depth of like the emotion that drives the character because of the relationship um, um, with his wife and you know that's all set up from that incredible first scene but as you get those moments uh, through like the middle of the movie and stuff where he's hearing this sort of like ghostly voice of his wife like beckoning him to go open that, that gate or whatever like you understand why the character is so driven and you and if you're like me like I kind of was like man I just I'm with Shang-Chi where Shang-Chi says like man I wish that was true like I wish this was true for you like I want you to be able to have this life and to be and to grow as a human being and improve but I also can see why this character is stuck in and this like role of violence in sociopathy that he's in like it's a really it's just a fucking really good performance there's two moments I want to highlight that just have stuck out to me as like kind of synecdoches for his performance one is when, so they find the map in that really cool scene where like the water bursts out of yeah. the, the walls. And honestly, at that point, they've kind of built up a warmer side of him over the last like 15 minutes of the movie. And, and you know, he's promising like his kids were going to see your mother again. And you can even see Shang-Chi and his sister are kind of like, di like wavering on like, is he, what is he up to here? And then he announces his plan that they're going to go invade Talo and all this stuff. And, and, and Shang-Chi's like, but but what if you're wrong? What if, and what if they like reject you again? And he turns and he's got this little smile on his face and he says, "Well, then I'm gonna burn down their entire village." And yeah. the way he says that sent chills down my spine because it's not a James Bond villain trying to intimidate someone. He's just saying a statement of fact and assuming yeah. everyone's gonna go along with him because he's megalomaniacal. And it's just like. Well, we're going to burn down their village together, son. It's going to be a great bonding activity. And the way Tony Leung plays that, 
there I don't think there's another actor on earth who could nail a moment like that because it is so built on like this little subtle like vocal inflection and like facial features and it is chilling to the core and it's a turning point because him saying that is what makes Shang Chi and his sister do what they do for the rest of the movie you yeah. know yeah and and it's like it's the consistency of of him being able to hold like that statement and then also the warmer version of the character you see in some of the scenes around the dinner table and stuff or in the like flashbacks um when the when when he was still married and, and they have their sort of family life like it, it's it's clearly the same person and and yes. he has not like fundamentally changed at any point in many ways that's like the problem with the character in, in terms of like why he's the villain like why he has to die at the end like why he sort of fails is that he can't change um, that he he maybe kind of wants to, or he's hoping that he can, but he can't ever change who he is. And that like level of consistency across what for a normal human being would be like wildly different ranges of emotion and expression. For him, it's like all contained in the same sphere, uh, and that's fucking scary. The other moment is when he gets to is it Talo is the is the name yeah, of the Talo is place? the place Talo, yeah so when he gets to Talo and all the villagers are waiting along with Shang-Chi you have the old man who like becomes Aquafina's oh, mentor yes. and the old man who is like comically old he's like yes. movie person old man beard makeup like it's an old actor playing even older like comically yes. old man and he comes up and says you know stop and and uh the, Tony Leung looks at him and says Basically says, like, step aside, young man. And he says it in Chinese, but you don't even fucking need the subtitles. Yeah. You don't need... It. You don't need... There is an explanation where the next line is he says, you know, I've lived ten of your lifetimes. You don't even need that line. Tony Leung just gives him a look of, like, you are nothing. I am a thousand years old. And you just believe him. You yeah. don't think about how he's acting. It's just like he gives this look of, like, yeah, shut up, young man. I'm a thousand years old. And he just effortlessly conveys that it's amazing yeah it's it's just that sense of the character's thorough belief that like everything in the world should just work in his favor right that it's like it's it's who he is he's he is this he has like through violence and conquest won everything he's ever wanted um and that has given him nothing right like it is because that's part of that narration at the beginning of the movie is that you know, he has toppled governments, he has won uncountable riches, he's built the world's largest army, all this stuff, and yet he has never found what he wants because he's empty inside. And and it's that's it's just it's it's a level of like performance and character that you just don't expect it's like most movies to have, but certainly like not a Marvel movie. Um like you wouldn't have the room in other Marvel movies for a character that is this like rich and compelling. Yeah, and like, you know, for Destin Daniel Cretton as a director, I would love to sit down and interview him and talk to him about, like, what was this like? Like, because he's, he's pretty young as a filmmaker. He's 42, which is definitely young for, like, a big filmmaker in Hollywood, yeah. right? And this is his fourth or fifth film. He broke out with Short Term 12 less than 10 years ago, and he's directing fucking Tony Leung in a major role. Yeah. Like, I kind of wonder what that's like because it feels like there's a lot of trust there. Like he gives a lot of space and Tony Leung gives back in kind. And, you know, I think one of the best moments of the whole movie is uh, the character's last moment on screen when he uh -huh. is in the like hands of like the ancient one or whatever it is, the big monster. And he is like basically ch making the choice to let himself die and give the rings to Shang-Chi and they don't use one line of dialogue. They don't do any exposition. They don't do any, like, big speech from father to son. And, like, Simu Liu falls to his knees and goes, Dad! They don't do any of that. He just holds on Tony Leung's face for about 30 seconds and lets him play the whole thing. And in his face, you see the whole arc of the character. You see all the reason that's going into this moment. And then he kind of lets his wrists, you know, go loose and sends the rings to, to Shang-Chi and that's it. And it's like, yes, if if you have an actor of this caliber, that's how you tell a fucking story, and you do it. And, uh, like, I wanted to stand up and applaud. Like, that is a great moment of direction of an actor and trust in an actor. Um, and that's just it's great stuff. And Simu Liu, on the other side of that, too, like, is yeah. playing a lot of that and is great. Yeah, because is that also the moment where they then do this thing where they, like, as they're doing that, they, like, cut two shots of Shang-Chi, like 
in reverse order of his life, right? Going back to Shang-Chi being a baby. I think um, so, yeah. Yeah, that's like, yeah, that's just a great combination of like acting and then the editing there of him seeing his son maybe like for like the first time really or like yes. for the first time since the mother died um yeah it's yeah it's fucking that shit is fucking great it's it's just you know Tony Leung is just so fucking good um <laughs> and it's the thing I love about his career is that he both is in stuff that is like very like artsy very like down to earth very character based but then he's also in stuff like Hard Boiled Infernal Affairs and Hero and Red Cliffs you know and so he's like he's an action star um you know he's in like big genre flicks too and it's like he carries that same weight and energy like whatever fucking thing he goes to so you know it's very appropriate that he does the same thing for Marvel because it's like I think it's like the mark of how good he is as an actor is it kind of doesn't matter what sort of genre or register you put him in he will fucking make it his own and knock a fucking home run out of the park yes and you know again if you want an actor who can sell a thousand years old helped shape human history but is also like has a deeply emotional inner life yeah i don't i don't know if there's another actor i could name that is yeah. that person but that's tony leung and everyone he's worked with and it's so good and i'm just if it sounds like we're going on and on about it it's because i'm still frankly in awe that the movie did it because I am uh -huh. so trained to be disappointed by Hollywood yeah. on this, you know, and it's, it's not, it's the opposite. This is, this is a movie that, that like really respects where it's coming from and what it's working with and who it's working with and who it's working for, you know, um, there's, there's still, I don't know if you followed the whole controversy around this, Sean, there's a chance this movie won't get released in China because, Whoa. uh, cause China is one has been cracking down on Hollywood releases since the pandemic started and, mm -hmm the biggest movies in the world have been Chinese and they've realized the Chinese movie market is plenty healthy without Hollywood. And so they're cutting bit back on their number of Hollywood imports. But two, there is still some like distrust in China from like sort of the ancestry of Shang-Chi in the comics and stuff. Like um, for good reason, they don't like this yeah. character over there. Um, but I, you know, I, I hope it gets released because I actually think, you know, I think Chinese audiences would love it. Marvel would obviously make a ton of money. It's frankly why they made this movie. Um, they greenlit this movie because they wanted it to come out in China more than America. Like, yeah. China gives them a lot of money. But, you know, it would it would be a shame if, if that didn't happen just because, like, you know, I feel like a lot of the audiences, it's kind of being pitched to that audience. In, and not pitched to that audience in ways that feel like, you know, we're cutting out our we're doing like a 10 second gay kiss scene so we can cut it out for the Chinese market. I mean, like actually like using actors and ideas and stuff. You know what I mean? Wasn't there a thing? Was it, it was it Iron Man three? Like, it's Iron Man three. Yeah. That had like uh, that woman who's like a big star over there. That's in like five seconds of the movie or something. But they shot more for like the Chinese cut. Wasn't it something like yes, that? There's, there's an actor in Iron Man three. Who's like some kind of comedian or star in China. And they shot these extra scenes for the, cause that movie was a Chinese co-production. It's one way you can get around their cute quotas is if you co-produce. And so, um, cause that movie was, came out under Disney, but was greenlit before the Disney deal. So anyway, it had this Chinese co-production money and they shot about five minutes of extra scenes with this guy and then they interspersed them in the movie. But it's like famously Chinese audiences were super confused because they just, they went to see an Iron Man movie and then like it kept cutting away to this random dude who like they knew but had nothing to do with the movie that had been made. So like, it's, it's, it's very funny. It's basically like what we did with uh, Godzilla with, when we made Godzilla King of the Monsters. It's like, it's just... Let's just throw, like, a white movie actor dude in there and just, uh, let's just cut to him and have him, like, say something that's vaguely connected to the plot of the movie and then cut back to the movie. Uh... <laughs> yes. No. And by Godzilla King of the Monsters, you mean the 1954 Ishiro Honda movie? And, yes. Yeah. Yes. Not, the the yeah. original American version where they imported the, the Japanese film and then dubbed it in English and then shot some scenes with an American actor named Raymond Burr as he, yes. like, gestures vaguely behind him. Um, then saying Godzilla's over there, and then they cut it's, to footage from the original film. It's very much like that, is my understanding, although even more surreal. I've looked into trying to like find a DVD of that version of Iron Man 3, because I'm fascinated to yeah. see what the fuck it is. I'm sure I can probably torrent it somewhere at this point by now, but like, yeah. Um, you know, they did not do that here. They they There's like one white guy in this movie, and I don't know if he even should have been in the movie. So, it's great. 
Yeah, but while we're on this topic, I th think this is a good time to, like, address a little bit of the, like, comic book origins of Shang-Chi. Uh, yes. Because we talked a little bit about the Bruceploitation thing. But I think one of the things that is amazing about the Tony Leung character is that that character is basically a, just an invention for this movie. And it's all true of, a, like, a lot of stuff. I'm not, like, an expert of Shang-Chi from the comic books, but I've read some, like, I've read some of the really old Shang-Chi stuff because it was in some of those big like omnibuses I bought back in the day and I've read some relatively more recent like not super recent but like in the 2000s recent Shang-Chi comics um and most of this stuff is just not really a Shang-Chi thing so like Ta Lo I'm pretty sure is in Marvel comics but I don't think it has any connection with Shang-Chi it's more of like it's basically like the equivalent the Marvel equivalent of like what Asgard is with Thor it's the, oh and then we have the Chinese pantheon over here and then the Greek pantheon is over there that's kind of like what Talo is from what I remember of the Marvel comics um I'm pretty sure Shang-Chi does not have a sister in the comics at all that Katie character is not a character from the Shang-Chi comics like almost everything from this movie is basically invented for the film um, which is good because like the roots of Shang-Chi comes from that Bruce Ploitation stuff and this like really bad Orientalist shit uh, that when I was like eight and read those comic books when I was also reading old Spider-Man comics I didn't did not understand and then when I got a little bit older I remember going back and looking through some of those omnibuses and realizing that the character that Tony Leung is playing uh, Shang-Chi's father which that dynamic is in the comics of Shang-Chi was raised by this like master assassin who's an immortal um, and trained to be an assassin and Shang-Chi realizes this is not what he wants to do and so he's fighting against his father's organization. That's the basic premise of what Shang-Chi was. The main difference is that his dad in the comics was literally Fu Manchu. I don't mean that his dad in the comics was like a Fu Manchu type stereotype. I mean, it was literally the character Fu Manchu from the early 20th century novels, which are like now like is just a basically derogatory term like those novels and like a lot of the media and adaptations based on them. Like some of where you get like lots of the um, like enduring, awful, horrible racial stereotypes of Chinese people and like Asian people in general. Um, and because the character was public domain, effectively, they just used the character and other characters from those novels um, in the Shang-Chi comics. Uh, and so, obviously, they did not they did not have Tony Young play literal Fu Manchu because that would be, like, the worst thing you could do in the world. Um, but they also don't have him playing the Mandarin either because the Mandarin is an Iron Man villain. That's the, all the Iron Man 3 stuff. That they, they do that bait and switch with the Ben Kingsley character. Um... And the Mandarin also obviously like is basically a Fu Manchu type character. And he has the Ten Rings, which in the comics are ten rings that you wear on your fingers. And each one has a different power, like it's fucking Captain Planet or some shit. And here's the fire ring, here's the water ring, like that kind of thing. <laughs> um, I, don't think, I don't think the Mandarin had a heart ring, but he probably it would have been good if he had. Because then maybe evil stuff wouldn't have happened. I'm glad they didn't make Tony Leung do that. I just want to <laughs> say, I think that's good. I think that's, yeah. yeah. But that's basically the idea is that they were like 10 physical rings or like you could think of like the rings of power from Lord of the Rings. But they had like magic powers associated with each, each individual ring. Um, and I vastly prefer what they do with that concept here where they've made more or less their own original character with Shu Wen Wu, which is Tony Leung's character's name. They borrow some of the basic premise of the assassin raising his son that then the son fights against the assassin and, and the character being like immortal. But the idea of taking... I forget what it's called, but it's like a northern, kung, like northern Chinese kung fu style that uses those big, uh, like iron rings on their arms. Like if people have seen Kung Fu Hustle, there's a lot of great stuff about that in Kung Fu Hustle. Also a great movie. Um, and so like that's like a real thing, and you like kind of strengthen your forearms with them. And so taking that and have the be these ten rings he wears on his forearms. And that's so much more interesting because it, like, has roots in, like, the culture and the martial arts. And there's a lot of the story they tell through, like, the style of the martial arts of, like, the closed fist, like, big, hard, like, northern Chinese style and the softer, more flowing, open palm, like, southern Chinese yeah. style. That stuff is really smart. So tying that into the character and then having him, like, shoot these big rings around and, like, all the crazy shit they do. Like, it's so cool and it gives them... So much more interesting stuff to do with the fight than if it had been. And now I should use my laser ring that shoots a laser out of it. Like that shit would have been so bad. So I love that they have taken some of those like vague ideas from the comics where appropriate, but then made them all better 
like you know rinsed all the like awful orientalist racism out of them and like refreshed it all and came up with like a really kind of cool revitalized take on the whole shang chi like mythos and thing um and put it in this movie it's like that's one of the things i'm honestly most impressed with with this movie is how deft they are at picking and choosing what things to keep and what things to like twist and what things to just throw in the garbage like fu manchu and just make their own thing uh, it is it is a very smart script and like conceptualization process for how they put the movie together. Absolutely, I it, it really feels like the directive, you know, from Kevin Feige and Marvel was like, do what you got to do, right? Yes. Like, like take what people do love about Shang Chi and like, because clearly that character has resonated in a yes. certain way over the years, and like, and you know. <laughs> Uh, American minority groups are well versed in having to take what they can get from characters that have problematic elements, right? Yes. Uh huh. Yeah. So like, so like, you know, take what you know people do love, but then like, whatever you gotta reinvent, reinvent it, you know. And like, I love that because like, not that I think Marvel's movies have ever been like slavishly devoted to the comics, right? They've always been pretty good at like reworking things but this is one of as you say their bigger reworkings and so yeah and one of their more meaningful because this is one where like if you didn't rework it it wouldn't work um and yeah yeah because the other marvel movies you know we talked a lot about how comic american comic book movies are not like actually adaptations of like specific story arcs but they always do take like elements of story arcs and like major characters and they just use those this is like you know, it's not even you're, you're you. The only character in this movie that is from the Shang Chi comics is Shang Chi. Like that's basically it. Like everything else, they've 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 taken some elements of inspiration, but they are different characters fundamentally, uh, and that's yeah. the right choice. Absolutely. Uh, you mentioned Kung Fu Hustle. Did you notice that Shang Chi has a Kung Fu Hustle poster in his room? Yes. Yeah, yeah, I liked that. Uh -huh. That was a good little yeah. detail. Yeah. This is I definitely like... one I want to get the Blu-ray and freeze frame on some of the shots uh, just to look at all the great posters because there's some good poster shots with some uh, yes. good like Easter eggs in the background. His sister, Sha Ling, her room at the like Ten Rings compound has uh, just is a great production design because yes. like she grew up into a teenagehood there, which Shang Chi really didn't, and so she has all her like rebellious teenage girl era stuff, right? Yeah. And so that's like a really cool like just piece of character work through production design and stuff like that. Yeah, so it's really cool. I I think it's a uh, it's a good reinvention, and I think where they specifically address Iron Man three is great. So. You have half of it is great. Um, so if you don't remember in Iron Man three, the whole conceit of Iron Man three is that there was the Mandarin, but then halfway through, Tony Stark finds out it's Ben Kingsley playing a character, and he was hired by the Guy Pierce character, who's the actual villain. Which I actually thought was a pretty savvy way of doing that at the time. You can go back to our podcast and listen to that because um, it is a bit of a bait and switch, but also like I think it addresses the the racism of the character and also like America's need to have foreign enemies is like the whole idea there. But then you have the dinner scene in Shang-Chi where you have Tony Leung explain like, you know, there was this terrorist who needed a villain. So they put an actor and called him the Mandarin because they thought it would scare Americans. And then he has that line about like, that's what they thought was scary, an orange. And mm -hmm. I loved that line. I thought that was a great reworking of like Marvel history in that moment, you know? Yeah, I also love that scene. There's a, because he's talk, he talks to Katie and like asks her what her Chinese name Chinese is. Name and is like, yeah. There's something like so like dismissive in in a way that is like both like feels like appropriate the way he's dismissive about america but also like but you're also like dismissing like the experiences of your son and his best friend who have lived like most of their adult life in america uh it's a yes. good dynamic in that scene yeah this is a guy who this sounds like he doesn't even really think about america that much it's he's very, literally very like like America is the equivalent in his life of like the amount of time of our life we spent in college. Like it's right, like exactly. that's the yeah. amount of time America has existed. It's like oh, like two hundred years. That's great. I've been alive for like over a thousand. Great America. Yes. Exactly. It's fantastic. Um, then they they do bring back that character. So I I still don't quite know how I feel about it. The Ben Kingsley as Trevor Slattery in this. I thought it kind of hurt the pacing around the middle of the movie honestly and i don't know if i really needed it it definitely felt like a oh no please get a white person in here and then there is like there's some moments i find very funny i think this whole thing about planet of the apes makes me laugh very hard 
and then some of it I thought was like, okay, shut up and let the characters I care about talk, please. Um, that that is the one area of the movie that doesn't sit fully right with me. I have to say. Yeah, I think it would be better if it had not been that. Like, I think it would have been a tighter movie. But like, but but like, it is very contained. Like, I think the thing I was worried about when it happened was like, oh god, he's going to be in like a lot of the movie at this point. And really, the only thing he's in for like an extended stretch is just that little bit with like the car and then once they're actually in Talo it's mostly like he's kind of in the background of some shots and then they have the one gag of him pretending to be dead and then the character kind of melts away um so it's like it's it's it is a little bit sort of like messy in what is otherwise like such a top film that I think it kind of stands out more than it otherwise would so I agree with you there but I do I do find the character very fucking funny like I, I love Ben Kingsley's uh, Liverpool accent the Planet of the Apes joke is so good like the layers of that joke as it progresses through where you think <laughs> oh no he actually does understand this like no you see it was the monkeys were acting as if they were monkeys riding horses and you're like oh, okay no he doesn't he, does, he doesn't understand <laughs> it at all it's good Aquafina plays off him very good um yeah. It's it just it is that pacing issue because I feel like so where he enters the movie is when they've been locked up by their dad and their and the dad is going off to Talo and then they just literally hear him like making noises off screen and they go and find him and it's it's kind of the moment where the movie needs to like pick up steam and have them kick into like what they're going to do for the third act and instead you do have to go through the layers of introducing a new character who is minor enough in Marvel lore that they basically have to fully reintroduce yes. and recap it. But also he is a returning character, so there is this like weird tension there. And it's just it is like the one moment of noticeable slowdown in the movie for me. But I will say he was clearly a crowd pleaser. Both audiences I saw it with liked him a lot and particularly liked Morris, the animal with no face uh -huh. or ass he was with. Um and I do like... Morris is an adorable creature, so Morris is good. Um, I definitely... It did not feel as off to me on a second viewing, because as you say, it's... It's a, it's not an insignificant stretch of the film he's in, but it is a one sort of long series of scenes that add up to a sequence, you know? Yeah. And, and like, it, it helps that, like, Ben Kingsley is, like, very outrageously funny in that role. Like, yes. I think it would bother me a lot more if it wasn't, if I didn't just find it legitimately funny. Because, clearly, I think, like, the better thing for this movie unto itself would just be to have them encounter Morris, or, like, Morris appear, you know, as this magical yeah. creature, um, and then guide them to Talo just on its own, and have, like, maybe Aquafina somehow is able to understand him because they... Well, you know what I was thinking yeah. is that the whole story is that Morris was brought there by their mother... I was thinking while I was watching it that the sister, Sha Ling, that would have been a great way to give her more to do mm -hmm. in that part of the movie. Is like, what if she had an existing relationship with Morris from when she lived there in the years after Shang-Chi left? I feel like that would have been the best thing to do with it. But yeah, it's it's not horrible or anything. It doesn't ruin the movie. And you do get some good Ben Kingsley jokes out of it. It's just kind of the one noticeable weakness, I think. Yeah. And it's like I said earlier, like I actually suspect that that sequence might actually work better if you have not seen Iron Man 3 and you're just like this is just a brand new character that's just in this movie like I wonder if that experience almost feels more natural because I think part of it is like you're sitting there being like yes I understand I saw Iron Man 3 I saw the short where they the all hail the king thing that they did that like sort of puts the Mandarin <laughs> Ten Rings concept back into the play uh, which is a, a funny little bit um, so it's like when you see the reference it's like you kind of just are like looking at it and just seeing the reference, whereas I think someone else would probably not see as much artificiality in that um, if they just assumed this was just a thing in the movie. What percentage of the audience... I mean, I a high percentage of the audience will have seen Iron Man 3. That movie made like $1.5 billion. Yeah. What percentage of the audience remembers Ben Kingsley was in Iron Man 3 or frankly remembers anything from Iron Man 3? <laughs> Iron Man 3 came out eight years ago. So, I know. That's... Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I was sitting uh, like like close to, like the closest people uh, in the movie theater because there was, you know, the movie's been out for like three weeks and we saw it on a Saturday afternoon. So there was not a super packed theater, but there was like a, a dad with what I would guess like... 13 14 year old daughter there and and she had no idea who the character was but she found it very funny like i could hear her like laughing very clearly at every single joke and then at one point i heard her so dad is like is he like from a thing or something uh and and it made me occur to me it's like 
oh right she would have been like four years old when iron man 3 came yep. out it's like it's like she would be she would have been younger than the kid that is in iron man 3 that his age in that movie she would have been like a little yeah. baby basically so yeah i think most people probably don't really remember distinctly that ben kingsley was a character in that movie um other than people who do podcasts that have reviewed every one of these fucking movies on their right which is also why i just thought it was a little weird of like we're gonna we need it's it is that feeling that i sometimes get where even when it's well done the marvel insistence on like every movie has to have like someone come in from another marvel thing which this movie already does with benedict wong and i felt that was like way more organic on yes. both ends where you see him in the re- arena early on and then he comes in at the end and both of those are like I mean, one, just Wong being a master of the mystical arts and going anywhere in the world. Of course he would do that. Mm -hmm. And also, like, Benedict Wong being one of the major Asian characters in the Marvel Universe. You know, there's... That worked better for me. But, yeah, we're spending a lot of time on this and it's not that important. But I did did just want to talk about it. Yeah, no, I'm with you that it was, like, the main thing that stood out to me as, like, being the thing that I would have done differently were I making the movie to to make it more efficient. Let's talk about some of the other characters. So we haven't talked about his sister yet. I think clearly that's a character that's resonated with people. I've seen a lot of that online. Uh, Xia Ling is is a cool character. The the actress, this is essentially her first big movie, Meng Er Zhang. Um, and she's really good. I really like the kind of overall like tone of that character. I, I think what they did do in the story in terms of uh, her relationship with Shang-Chi is it's the perfect sweet spot of giving your character a tortured backstory because it's something that Shang-Chi will feel guilty about because he abandoned his sister, but we in the audience will not blame him for because he was an abused 14-year-old boy yes. running from his abuser. So like he will feel guilty, but we will naturally go, it's okay, Shang-Chi, you were in a shitty situation. Um, and that's kind of the sweet spot for this, isn't it? <laughs> yes, and I love, and the movie is like very aware of that because you have Aquafina say that to him, right? She's like, you do realize you were a 14-year-old boy who was trained by your father to be an assassin. You were like abused from the moment you were like eight years old to, 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 to do this. It's like, you do know how messed up that is, right? And, and yeah, you're right, that it is the sweet spot of where it shows you how sort of compassionate and gentle and kind uh, Shang-Chi is as a character that that he would feel very guilty about it while we all understand this like well you didn't really have much of a choice there's nothing you could have done um you know like you were trying to escape from your father as desperately as you could it's like very understandable um yeah but then it's and then on the other side it's very understandable how because she has also been abused since she was a child child by her father how her child shaoling would be by the fact that her brother never came back for her and that feeling of abandonment yeah, and I do like the character. I think the uh, Shaoling is a cool character. She's got really good, you know, fighting moves. I love that she's the one who uses, like, the rope dart thing. Yes. And that is cool as shit. It's awesome. There's some really cool moves with that. And clearly, like, that last post credits scene, it feels like they're probably not sure exactly where they want to deploy the character, but, like, leave her in play doing, like, this, like, clearly not using the Ten Rings for, like, evil, but, like, just to be a badass. Yeah. Um, it's a cool, like, status quo to kind of leave open for the future. And, and I, it's actually something I want to call out. Both post credit scenes in this movie are about this movie. And I really mm-hmm. appreciated that. Because most Marvel movies, the post credits thing are like, we're going to sell you a movie six months from now or something. This is like, both of the post credit scene relate directly to the world of Shang-Chi and future stories in that world. And I really appreciated that. Yeah, yeah, I agree um that it's 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 refreshing that it just like makes this feel like it is like the jumping off point for marvel for the future that's like yes this feels like a very kind of like fresh start uh that and how you know those scenes are about this movie um but yeah on on shu i one thing i love about her is just like the whole punk rock aesthetic of that character it's so good i'm like so deeply into um even though i think you, you can you can see it coming in a very good way of of that she's going to be involved with or do you find out this is she's like running this whole like the fucking crazy underground fight arena or whatever or i guess it's not an underground fight arena it's on the top of a fucking skyscraper which is way cooler than an underground yes, fight arena yes. um like, but yeah, that reveal when she comes in and she just kicks the shit out of Shang-Chi in the arena, uh, that's just such a wonderful character introduction. Yes. That, I love that whole scene. I like Ronnie Chang there. He's uh-huh. great. Um, I think some of the little Easter eggs you have there are fun. Did you, although, did you notice that that was supposed to be the abomination from Hulk when you saw the movie? Yes. Yeah, I did. Okay. I did not. Because he doesn't look 
even one little iota like he did in the Incredible Hulk movie. It's a complete redesign. I know it's closer to the comics, but I haven't read those. So it was completely lost on me. Yeah, but you, I mean, you clearly you were just paying attention because Wong also called him Emil, which is, of course, the name of the character that becomes the Abomination, so. Yeah, I, you know, Sean, I do not remember the name <laughs> of the villain from The Incredible Hulk. On the second viewing, because I had read an article about it, I noticed Wong called him Emil, and I'm like, I guess that's that guy's name. But, um, yeah, that, I, I do, I just want Marvel to know the Easter egg doesn't work if the audience doesn't recognize the character from a movie you've basically decanonized. Just, you know, just so you know. <laughs> it, it worked for me. I mean, I know what the fucking abomination looks like. Uh, yeah, I think it's it's more, I think it is legitimately more of like a comic book reference at some point than it is yeah. a movie reference. It's like technically that character is in uh, The Incredible Hulk, but, you know, it's not like they didn't get that actor back or anything. As you say, they, they I mean, they needed to redesign the character. I don't even know what trying to use that character design would even look like in 2021 compared to, when did that movie come out? 2009? Yeah. Like, uh, it's... Uh, yeah. and, and Sean, they did get that actor back. Tim what? Roth does the vocal work for Emil Blonsky in that scene. I'm reading this on Wikipedia. Okay, well, the, never mind. The, then, clearly, Jonathan, you just really weren't paying attention because it's even, it's <laughs> Tim Roth going, err, uh, in that scene. Yeah. No, I liked the scene. I liked uh, Wong, like, using the guy's own fist to, like, hit him and then walking it off with him. That was funny. Um, it was just fun. But, yeah, I like that whole scene in the arena. I also like that when they are heading into that building where, like, the fight arena is going to be on top, you see on the side of the building all these, like, bamboo structures of, like, the, the like scaffolding for construction. And I've seen Jackie Chan movies, so I go, uh -huh. they're going to do an action scene there. Yep. Yep. Yeah, you don't have a you don't go to the top of a skyscraper if you're not going to have like death defying jumps and stuff like that. Yeah, absolutely, and uh, it's well done. So, liked all of that. Last character to talk about would be Aquafina as Katie. What do you think there? I was very good. It's just she's very funny. Uh, like yeah. I, I like the you know because so much of the movie is about like Shang Chi having to sort of like consolidate all the elements of his past and who he is as a person and like sort of, you know, instead of trying to sort of compartmentalize all these elements of his own life to um, bring it all together and like have it become, become kind of whole. Um, and I like Katie being there as like the sort of like Asian American representative of like, this is like from this part of your life. And I like that they don't ever forget that, that like, this is a thing that he, this is like the most time he's lived his life really has been in America. Um, it's like the longest, most stable part of his whole life has been this, and his relationship and friendship with Katie sort of like represents that, and and I love that. I love that it's like it's constantly there, like reminding you that in a like much better world, Shang Chi would have just grown up as like a happy kind of dorky, good looking guy, right? The thing that you see in those San Francisco scenes, or when you get like some of that stuff at the end when they do the callback to the dinner scene and you see this like this is who you want Shang-Chi to just be able to be most of the time is just have fun and goof around and be a little like dorky um and and I, I like Katie's role in the film to like kind of always remind you that that's like a part of who he is also yeah totally and and I just like the character Aquafina is a is an actress I like I've seen her in lots of things at this point you know um Ocean's 8, Crazy Rich Asians, the, the Farewell, which is one of the best movies of the last few years, and she's phenomenal in that. That's more of a drama. Um, but I always enjoy seeing her. She's very fun in this. Um, good really good chemistry with Simu Liu, which matters a mm -hmm. lot, obviously. Honestly, my only disappointment, why can't Marvel characters just kiss at the end of movies? <laughs> it does confuse me a little bit. Yeah, what, like they, I, I think, like, I, I, like... There's a part of me that almost kind of likes it with this one. There's something about like I, it's it's I'm I'm still mixed on how much of like a romantic chemistry I feel between them. Like there's something about them being best buds that I I love so much. Um, that that it usually kind of bothers me in Marvel that like they kind of tiptoe around it. There's something about their chemistry in this movie that I didn't have as much of a problem with it. I guess I I guess I felt like it can be both, and like they can be best buds who also like would be together because like. The the one thing that distracted me on this was when I rewatched the movie. That first act, I think it's more than just other people think they should be in a relationship. It feels like the movie is like, it's like doing a setup. It's planting something for a later payoff where like them not acknowledging that they sort of like each other more than friends is also a way in which they are not like 
admitting to reality mm-hmm. and like growing up. Um, and the end of the movie kind of intimates it in how they kind of go arm in arm off into the distance. But like, I don't know. I it it was a little just it, and it's it's obviously it's part of this broader trend that like Marvel just has gotten rid of romance from superhero movies and. I feel like we've the, there was definitely a point in which every superhero movie having to have a forced romance was very bad. We've talked about that with like our Batman podcasts, yeah. right? But I do feel like the pendulum has swung way too hard in the other direction where like superheroes have to be beyond chaste and I find that very bizarre. Like the biggest Marvel kiss in recent years is Loki kissing another Loki. Uh, you know, like what are we doing? It's a little weird. I agree. It's look, it doesn't hold this movie back or anything, but it was something where it felt like the movie just didn't commit on that one way or another. I don't know if that makes sense. I I agree with you that it doesn't commit on it because I think the thing that happens is like the first act, I agree like 100% feels like it's setting up that dynamic. And I think, but the thing, the reason why it doesn't ultimately bother me is that like the movie just kind of drops that dynamic. Like it just is not developed at all throughout the rest of the film until at the end you get i think like vaguely romantic vibes from the way they lock arms but it also feels like you know like i would i want to see more stories with the characters to see what they do with it um because i think there there might just be a read of it of like it doesn't have to be a like romantic intimacy um it can just be a like you know a friend intimacy right that like they like some sort of like boundary has come down because shang chi has let that boundary come down of like he just gets to be his full self not just the self that he's showing her um in his kind of asian american life i can totally buy that um while also definitely pounding the drum for the uh let superheroes fuck movement which i do just let superheroes fuck again what the heck why why aren't we why aren't we doing this anymore can you know? Can you imagine Sam Raimi Spider Man if if Peter Parker didn't get to kiss Mary Jane? They, they wouldn't be the same movies. I yes, I agree. <laughs> it's all good. All right. Uh, what else to talk about with Shang Chi? I mean, there's the whole third act in Talo. Talo is very cool. They shot in New Zealand. Um, New Zealand looks cool. We know this from Lord of the Rings and many other uh-huh. movies. Um, I think the thing I love about Talo and a lot of that stuff near the end most is that it's got just a bunch of cool, like, monsters and dragons and all sorts of stuff going around. I love the weird horse they meet. Uh, and then, of course, the, the like, powerful one, or whatever they call it, the, 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 great the guardian. The great protector, who comes out at the end, and we just have a full action sequence where our hero is riding around on a Chinese dragon. I loved how much they kind of cut loose in that final act. Yeah, there's definitely some, like, sick uh, kaiju movie-esque vibes in that last action scene where they they fight the giant bat monster um, with a giant Chinese dragon. And yeah, I I love how they did Talo. Like, the whole aesthetic of just pulling in... Um, because all those creatures are like Japanese mythological creatures. So like the weird horse is a Kirin or like a Chinese unicorn. They've got like the big guardian dog things with like the one horn. Um, they've got a nine tailed fox. Like a lot of these are also, if you like animals or monsters in Japanese mythology because of that kind of cultural crossover. Um, but it is, it is, uh, cool to see this sort of like fantasy version of China represented, uh, in a big budget movie with that kind of like scale and stuff like that because it's just a version of like fantasy that you just don't see represented very often um it's like similar to like some of the stuff that they do with like Li Yue in Genshin Impact right they they it's pulling from some of that like artistic inspiration um you know like in in Genshin Impact Ganyu she's half one of those weird looking horses she's half Keating so it's pulling from some of those same kind of stylistic aesthetics from Japanese history and Japanese or not Chinese history and Chinese art um in the movie and i'm always down for seeing a different version of mythology and fantasy represented in our movies rather than just like the same vaguely medieval europe lord of the ringsy thing we do most of the time absolutely it, it definitely adds a lot to the final act too because all the action is great i mean man the final fight between shang chi and his dad is it's i want to second what you said earlier about how they use the 10 rings in this is uh-huh. just so cool and like a really actually good use of cgi on top of actual like 
down to earth fight choreography that's really great um but then just throwing the dragon in there on top of it and i do love that a not insignificant portion of this movie is our main character riding around on a dragon um that's pretty great that's that's definitely one of those like superhero movie things you could not imagine in a pre-mcu world um and i very much love that it's here yeah and it's like it's the it's the superhero spice in this movie too that it's like that's like a scene that you would not see in a traditional martial arts movie or even no. really a wuxia movie right like wuxia would get closer yeah. to this but it still wouldn't do something that's quite so ridiculous in big scale um and yeah it's it's like that's a nice that's the thing that makes it a marvel movie or something it, it, it's like well it's we're just gonna go crazy and big with it and have a giant dragon fight i love like all the stuff of shang chi getting all 10 rings and like creating this big fucking circle of the rings on the the bat monster's chest and fucking blowing it up um, they definitely could have made that a way more graphic uh, into that yes. monster. It's like, it's just like he does blow it up. They luckily they don't like you know show you a bunch of chunks of it, but he he fucking kills the but shit out of that thing. That's got to be the coolest end to a Marvel fight ever, yeah. right? Uh-huh. Like him him sending all the rings and he goes up in the sky. Like it's the closest I can imagine like live action coming to doing Dragon Ball. Basically, uh-huh. is where yeah. he's up in the sky and does this like big kick down. Like honestly, I was actually thinking this while watching the movie yesterday, Sean. Is that if you were to do a Dragon Ball movie? Uh, specifically Dragon Ball, not Dragon Ball Z, because I don't uh-huh. think you can do Dragon Ball Z live action. But if you were to do, like, the Tenkaichi Budokai movie, you would do it like this, where, like, they're mm-hmm. not literally sending beams, but, like, the way that they're, like, manipulating air and kind of making it a little more, like, balletic in the, like, movements of the martial arts. It's really cool, and I love how they do it. And it's just such a big, crazy conclusion. I love it. Um, all of that stuff is is great, and it's just such a cool final action sequence. Yeah, and the way that all of it is, like, modeled around that shift in Shang-Chi's character where he, like, it, he starts, you know, he's got his, like, very tense, closed fist style that is the thing he yes. learned from his father. Then he goes to Talo and learns from his aunt, played by Michelle Yeoh, um, that is also the fucking... She's in this movie too, which is fucking awesome. You're, yeah, if you're gonna if you're gonna establish your fucking bona fides, Michelle Yeoh is a pretty good way to do it. Crouching Tiger... You know, police story three, all of her yeah. stuff in Hong Kong. She's just one of the greats, and she's so good. Yeah, here. and that's a great scene that sort of like reflects some of that opening scene again, where he's with his aunt, and and he learns a little bit more of like that open palm, very graceful, more like Tai Chi style um, martial art um, from her. That's very relaxed, and it's that kind of like water flowing kind of thing. Um, and then I like that it feels like they, in the action choreography, then they kind of have Shang-Chi find some kind of balance between those where he's not just doing the martial arts that he learned from his mom. He's not just doing the big closed crazy thing with his dad. It is this mix of both of them and blending that with the 10 rings. Like it's just, that's the kind of thing that you want from, um, you know, someone like a Brad Allen for your like stunt coordinator and your action choreography is like finding the ways to express what is clearly like the heart of the story of the movie and the theme of the movie is about him building himself from all the like elements of his past and kind of finding a piece by putting them all together, the good and the bad, and having that physically be represented in the way the character carries himself in fights and have that evolve over the course of the third act. Like that's just some grade A fucking awesome martial arts movie stuff that they do there uh and yes yeah and then it, it concludes with a giant dragon and blowing up a giant bat monster because that's what it is for him to achieve enlightenment and that's fucking cool <laughs> no but i i definitely on a second viewing even more so i respond to that because what i love about that move from the closed fist to the open fist is that it's 100 percent communicated visually mm-hmm. they're like michelle yo does not give him a speech about like you having your fist closed makes you closed off but if you open like there's none of that what she does is she grabs his hands and opens it and mm-hmm. then he starts doing that and when he does it in front of his father during their final fight, you see on Tony Leung's face how taken aback by it he is. Because mm-hmm. he sees his wife there, and he sees what his son has become. Um, and it's really beautifully told. It's genuinely subtle, and it's really good, you know? Yeah, and for the last moment for Tony Leung's character to be him having his clenched fists with the rings, and then just like, relax and let that go, and the rings fall away and go to Shang-Chi. Like, yeah. it's it's that visual imagery is so consistent throughout that whole piece and as you say it's entirely visual entirely to the actors in in the direction it is not a thing where someone has to sit there and give you a big speech about like the philosophy of kung fu or something 
Yes, absolutely. So, so, so good. Um, and I am also very glad. I was very worried that they were going to, like, destroy the Ten Rings at the end when they destroyed the bad guy. I'm like, no, keep the Ten Rings. They're so cool. Yeah. And he does. At the end of the movie, he still has the Ten Rings. Good. I want to see Simu Liu as Shang-Chi doing more crazy action with those fucking rings because they're great. Yeah, it is a thing that, like, it gives him a good leg up in any future team-ups with other Marvel heroes that, like, eventually yes. they'll do something with that. Uh, because it's like, you know, I love Shang-Chi just being the master of the martial arts. But also, you know, if he's going up against fighting with or against, like, a Thor or a Hulk or Captain America or whoever, you know, the guy kind of needs a little something extra to kind of push him over the edge to kick some <laughs> ass. Um, and those ten rings kick a lot of ass. I would like to see him fight the Hulk. That would be pretty fun. Yeah. Um, there's there's a lot of good matchups here. So we do get that scene in the uh, end credits where he, he goes with Wong and they have their little Zoom session with Captain Marvel and uh, Bruce Banner. Um, notable thing, Bruce Banner is back to being a human again. Uh -huh. He is not in Hulk, Professor Hulk form anymore. I'm a little sad about that, but I do also understand that they want Mark Ruffalo in more things and they can't mocap him forever. Yeah, it, it's very it, expensive. Yeah, it probably would also, you know, be very like a stupid amount of expense to do for this one scene in this movie. Like, it's yes. just like, just have it be, just have it be fucking Bruce Banner. Yeah. yeah, but I I actually really liked that that little scene, and I like the idea that in a post Tony Stark, post Steve Rogers world, that those two are sort of like the like father figures of the Avengers, sort of mm -hmm. overseeing things, and which makes sense. They're both responsible people. <laughs> um, yeah, I liked that, and I liked I really liked how Mark Ruffalo plays that scene of like you guys are you guys are in for it now. It's it's very good. Yeah, and it was it especially it, it almost made me weirdly emotional just because of like, you know, the last time we've seen that character was in game, which is before all the shit that's happened in the world right now <laughs> happened, right? Yes. Like it's be pre-pandemic and all that stuff. And so it's like, "Oh my god. Oh, oh you you sweet gentleman Mark Ruffalo. Thank you. Like it's just nice to see you again." Um and, and they're specifically reminding us about him because he's going to be in the She-Hulk series alongside Tatiana right. Maslany. So we're going to yes. get way more Mark Ruffalo. Oh, it's pretty fucking good, huh? Yeah, that's fucking great. Oh, my God. And then you have that whole in bit where they're with Benedict Wong and he, like, gives them this very big, solemn speech about, like, your lives will be changed forever, blah, 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 blah. And then they're like, but... And then it cuts to that karaoke joke. That got the biggest fucking laugh I have heard in a long time from a group of people. Like, even back when I went to movie theaters, it, that was yeah. so great. And yeah, just, like, because seeing it, because it's also the callback to the Hotel California thing is very funny. But just, like, seeing the like those two characters with Wong in the karaoke is just, like, so... The like the mental picture of like all the steps that they took to get to the point where they're drunk in karaoke is hilariously funny for me to imagine. Uh, it's great. it is, and what I love about it is it's a joke where as soon as you have Benedict Wong making the speech, I know exactly where that joke is uh -huh. going, and it makes it. And honestly, the that they draw it out so much only makes it funnier. It's one yes. of those jokes that's like so obvious you have to do it. And I love that they do it, and it's a great ending to the movie. And, uh, you know, just, I would, Benedict Wong is such a great actor who bounces off people so well. Just start dropping him in all the Marvel movies uh -huh. and have him, like, doing stuff with people. Just have him coming through portals in Spider Man and have him come through a portal in the Eternals at some point in November. Just, I want him everywhere. Just put Benedict Wong in things. He's great. Yeah, I'm 100% with you. Like, he, he's got that presence of where, like, you know, he doesn't try to dominate a scene or anything like it feels like he's very like giving to other actors so it's like it's it just you can imagine him in a scene with any character in any marvel thing like in season two of loki just have him come through a portal and he's in the fucking time variance authority or some shit just have him pop up wherever whenever just to have a chat just to have some fun yeah um just I'm keep him on call he's great yeah. um i just i even love i remember his scene in infinity war is one of my favorite scenes uh -huh. in that movie you know, because yeah. he's just, he and, yeah. And we're going to be getting a lot more of all of that with Spider-Man and the new Doctor Strange and all of that. It's uh, it's an exciting time. There's a lot of good Marvel stuff coming. But this is definitely, this bodes very well. Because I hope if if this can be this standalone and, like, expansive, and then we're going to get Eternals, we're getting the She-Hulk thing, we're getting the new uh, Miss Marvel. There's a lot of new heroes they're doing. And if they're all going to, I don't expect everything will be as good as Shang-Chi, but if they're sort of allowed to go in this direction... That's a really exciting time for Marvel, along with, like, the returning heroes we're getting are, were sort of in the C or B tier before, and now they're going to be elevated, like Doctor mm -hmm. Strange. That's a lot of fun. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's a very exciting time in a way that, like, 
you know, I enjoyed the MCU shows, particularly Loki, but it, but, um, you know, WandaVision and Captain America or Falcon and the Winter Soldier slash Captain America and the Winter Soldier. Like, I enjoyed those shows, I think, overall more than you did, particularly Falcon. But, like, it is still exhausting. Like, it's an exhausting kind of like, okay, yeah, it's the MCU thing. Like, I enjoy them in the moment, but it doesn't invigorate me in the way that like when marvel does do really good like a black panther um it's so invigorating and this is that feeling like i feel coming out of this movie the same way i felt coming out of black panther of like fuck yeah i can't believe it just makes me think back to being a kid and watching a jackie chan movie and then going and reading a shang chi comic book and being like god this is so awesome and then having that then be a thing that like is this huge like big super profitable thing like this movie has like proven that movies can still like make fucking big bucks uh right now um and have it be more than that it's box office is genuinely astonishing like it um it did huge in september in a pandemic that's like sean it broke the labor day weekend record double it doubled the previous labor day weekend record in a pandemic yeah. Like, that's insane. Those are insane numbers. And just like, and it looks like it did pretty well this weekend, too. It's going to do about 35 million, which is a little less than a 50% drop, which is pretty normal. Um, like, it's big, you know? It's almost like there are lots of groups of people in America who don't always see themselves yes. on screen. And if you make movies for them, they'll go to them, and everyone else will, too, because it won't look like every other movie on the planet. Yeah, and so Marvel having, like, exhausted all of its sort of, like, generic white dude superheroes. I mean, they have not exhausted all of its generic <laughs> yeah, white dude Sean superheroes. I know that that's that. not true. But, like, the bigger ones, like in Iron Man and the Captain America and a Thor, right? Like, like which I love yeah. all those characters, but, like, they all are cut from a very similar cloth. And now going into doing movies like Black Panther or this with, like, Shang-Chi... Um, or like, you know, the Eternals is, is like a big multicultural group of characters and it just looks fucking crazy. And I'm very excited for that one too. Um, yeah. it's, it's a very exciting time to see what were much more obscure characters, um, get the limelight here and find this audience and becoming like some of the best versions of themselves, like particularly with Shang-Chi. I mean, Black Panther had had a very, like very powerful and great run of a lot of different amazing comic books that you know, made that character a little bit better than its origins, um, uh, which were also not as fraught as Shang-Chi's origins are. <laughs> um, but like th- doing this and kind of bringing these characters to the pop culture is so satisfying in a way that um, reminds me of a little bit of how I personally felt when like Iron Man hit and being like, oh, people can like Iron Man. I like Iron Man, but I thought everyone, nobody knew who the fuck Iron Man is. And having that happen with, for people for whom like this is much more important because you don't have a hundred other characters like this in other movies that you can just go watch um, made in the culture that you're from. Like that does feel really powerful and it, and is, is awesome. And I hope it's the thing that Marvel continues to break this kind of ground because I think it's the brightest future that they have ahead of them. Yeah. There's, there's a lot of possibilities. If you go down this road, it's all upside if you do it well, you know? So, and this is good. This is definitely one of Marvel's finest hours. I love it, and uh, I'm excited to see more. That Eternals movie does look good. Eternals, by the way, first Marvel movie made by an Oscar-winning director because yep. of uh, Chloe Zhao, who won this year. So that's pretty cool. That movie definitely looks good. Um, and we'll be back in November for that and December for Spider-Man. Sean, we got a lot we got to get through this year. we got to do Mar- Matrix podcasts. we got more Gundam to do. At some point, we got to finish the Batman series. There's, there's a lot going on. Yeah, it, it, is. it feels like, you know, like like thing, things are happening again. Movie theaters are things that you can go to, kind of, uh, uh, and there are movies there to watch. Uh, it's, it's a good feeling. 